Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our refinery committee meeting. I'm Clark Parker, uh, the chair of the South Coast Air Quality Management District Refinery Committee, uh, which is a subcommittee of our governing board. Uh, before I get started, let me introduce uh, the members here on the dais. Uh, to my immediate right is Dr. William Burke, who is our governing board chairperson. And to my immediate uh, left is Larry McCullen, McCallan, that is. He's a member of our governing board and also the vice chair itself of our refinery committee. And to his left is uh, Judith Mitchell, who is the also member of our governing board uh, and also is a elected official uh, mayor pro tem itself of the Roland Hill Estates. To my immediate right, uh, not immediate right, but next right is Dr. Joseph Liu, who is a member of our governing board, and to uh, his immediate right is our governing board member, uh, Ben Benoit. Thank you very much for coming today. I know you've been going to meetings over the last year and a half or so since we were here approximately a year ago. In order to see exactly how what progress has been made, we call this meeting today for our staff to present to us as a committee and also to the community uh, exactly what progress and what uh, information that they have gathered and uh, any proposals that they would be making to us as we go forward. I would like to uh, state that we have been receiving a large number of documents and people interested in the topics we are discussing here today. Uh, documents was received as late as last night and still are being received as of this morning. We placed copies of those documents on tables out in the hallway for your review if you want to. Uh, any particular specific copies of any particular document, uh, we would invite you to uh, uh, contact the committee's secretary, Christina Lopez, at her email address, clopez, that's C-L-O-P-E-Z, at A-Q-M-D, Dot gov. So uh, that way we have making them available to you today if you want to review them and if you want copies of them that's how to get copies. That being said, we also have approximately over a hundred cards right now. Uh, at the time itself of public comments of those people who want to speak. We are going to be designating that each person will be given two minutes. That doesn't mean that you have to take two minutes to speak. You can take less, because otherwise we'll be here all day and night. And uh, as we get more and more cards, uh, if that would be the case, uh, we would even have to come back you know, again, because we only have this room until 3 o'clock this afternoon. Then other people, I think the last time that we had one of these, someone had a wedding that was coming in. So they said, you guys got to get out because someone has got to get all joined together. So what we want to do is we want to be uh, 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 remindful of that particular uh, time constraint. When the time itself is over with, we ask you to courteously please relinquish the microphone and let others who want to come up and speak, speak. Uh, we have uh, a couple of individuals uh, this morning that after we make our staff presentation uh, that our elected officials uh, from our elected officials offices that will be coming and, uh, and, and addressing us uh, and then we'll go right into our public comment period. So Executive Director, uh, Mr. Nastry, I'm going to turn it over to you for staff presentation, please. Thank you, Dr. Parker. In early April of last year, the Refinery Committee held a two-day investigative hearing attended by more than 250 residents and refinery workers. 
South Coast AQMD board members questioned numerous experts and listened to the community members uh, to help inform the agency's effort to reduce air pollution and improve the safety of the Torrance refinery. Shortly after the investigative hearing, staff started the rule development process for proposed Rule 1410, use of hydrofluoric acid at refineries. Staff has held six working group meetings that include all of the stakeholders, refineries, business representatives, union representatives, environmental and community groups, and other agencies. Through the working group process, there have been a variety of presentations on alternative alkylation technologies. A representative from the American Petroleum Institute uh, spoke and discussed safe operation of hydrofluoric alkylation units and an opportunity for Torrance Refinery and Valero to discuss their current mitigation measures. In addition, representatives from Torrance Refinery Action Alliance presented information on modified hydrofluoric acid and hydrofluoric acid alkylation dangers. Staff presented initial rule concepts at the last working group meeting in September and is now seeking feedback from the public and the committee regarding the direction of the proposed Rule 1410. Dr. Fine will present additional background information on proposed Rule 1410 and an overview of hydrofluoric acid, staff's assessment of modified hydrofluoric acid technology, costs, and current thoughts with regards to proposed Rule 1410. Dr. Fine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nastri, and uh, good morning, uh, members of the public, uh, Chairman Parker, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm happy to go into where staff uh, stands at the moment in terms of the rule development process. Uh, we're just going to get the slides rolling. So as Mr. Nastri mentioned, uh, we've had a full public process and, and plan to continue this full public process going forward. Uh, that, that the last refinery committee was held in April of last year, and we've had six working groups uh, since then. Uh, they've been very well attended. We've had some in the community, uh, and uh, there's been a lot of good feedback. And as Mr. Nastri mentioned, uh, in, in this particular working group, uh, unlike some of our other working groups, we've really invited in a wide variety of stakeholders and technical experts to do their own presentations in these working groups to really get a feel on the lay of the land in terms of, of uh, this process, the dangers, mitigation, and what could be done going forward. Uh, in addition to the working group meetings, we have, have numerous individual meetings, both with community groups as well as the refineries. Uh, the meetings with the refineries have really dug into some of the real technical issues around the use of modified HF and the, and the uh, benefits that might afford. Uh, there's been site visits. Uh, we've also had some interagency meetings with US EPA as well as uh, Cal OSHA. So we've really been gathering this information and uh, what we'll be presenting today is kind of the results of uh, where we stand today. So uh, the genesis of this rulemaking, why, why this started, was largely due to what happened at the refinery back in 2015 uh, when uh, there was a near-miss accident. There was an explosion of the electrostatic precipitator, another pollution control device, and uh, some very heavy uh, elements of that, of that device came very close to uh, hitting or, or, or landing very near the alkylation unit. Uh, this uh, uh, raised some community concerns about the unit safety, the potential release of HF, and that risk. Uh, these concerns had been ongoing, but I think this heightened, heightened the concerns once this happened. Uh, we do know, and I'll talk about it in a moment, that the, the hazards of HF are greater than the hazards of sulfuric acid, just in terms of exposure to one versus the other. Uh, and what has also happened, uh, you know, maybe since this was looked at, you know, over the, a, a couple of decades ago, is that now we have more studies and more documentation and more information on MHF. And the other thing that has happened is uh, there has been some maturation of some of the alternative al alkylation technologies. So these are, this is why staff has embarked on this. Uh, and what we're doing is looking, doing a completely independent assessment of all the information that is out there uh, uh, and reassessing some of, the, some of the work that was actually done 20 years ago on modified HF. Next slide. So just to be clear, and this is not about the risk from any particular refinery or any particular process that uses hydrofluoric acid or sulfuric acid. This is just comparing the two acids in terms of exposure to humans. Uh, there are, they're both acids. There are some similarities. They're both colorless. 
Uh, they have, they have very different uh, uh, densities, but the most important thing is they have very different boiling points. So sulfuric acid has a very high boiling point, which means in, in temperatures that we all experience, it is primarily a liquid. If there is a spill of sulfuric acid, the vast majority will puddle on the ground. There will be a little bit evaporating off, but a very small percentage will evaporate off. With hydrofluoric acid, uh, if there was a spill and it was on the ground with a 67 degree Fahrenheit boiling point, it's quite likely that if it's a, just a moderately warm day, that it's above, already above the boiling point. So much more of that is going to be emitted as a vapor. Uh, and that is one of the big differences about a release of these two, uh, these two species. Um, and then in terms of hazards, there's hazards to exposure to acids of all types, uh, including sulfuric acid and HF. But HF has a, another property about uh, uh, if you have dermal exposure, other types of exposure, uh, you get those deep tissue burns like a lot of acids, but it really does migrate into the body and can actually change the bone structure. Uh, in a way that, that it makes it uh, a much more, much more of a concern than some of the other acids like sulfuric acid, nitric acid. Um, you do have, a de and, that, and that effect is, can be delayed. So while other acids, you, you have an immediate effect, you know what's happening, you, you, you try to uh, address those symptoms, uh, you can have a delayed effect of HF, which is another problem. So, um, so yeah, so you know, there's, there could be mitigations for both. So this is just that near-miss accident. I think everyone knows about this, that uh, you know, back in 2015, uh, the, that ESP had the explosion, and, and uh, debris did fall very close to the alkylation unit and the settler tank, and there's about 47,000 pounds of modified HF in each of, those, each of those settler tanks. Next slide. So what we've done on, on the technical side, and I'm not going to go into all the details of the, of the technical assessment of modified HF uh, that, that has, been, has occurred. I have one technical slide coming up next, which I'll apologize for in advance. But uh, we've looked at everything that has been provided, some of which is public information, some of which uh, is some business confidential information, of really assessing the, the, the additive of modifying HF and what level of safety does that, uh, does that afford uh, this process. So there's essentially, it's a very complex process. It is, uh, it's not just an engineering question, it's a very fundamental scientific question, chemical question about how, how the different chemicals interact. And I think it's safe to say that with all the studies that have been done, there's still a lot of uncertainty in how this would behave under certain conditions that may occur during a, 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 an accident. Uh, so just a summary of our results are that there is some mitigation benefits offered by the modification of HF. Uh, how much isn't very uncertain, but even if you take uh, all the, the best interpretation of all the studies that have been done, uh, and uh, you give the refineries the claims that they're making uh, the complete benefit of the doubt, it's, it probably offers 35% or less benefit. So the point of this is that while there is some safety afforded by modified HF, that it is not alone the thing that makes a dangerous HF, a dangerous chemical HF completely safe. It is one of many things that have, is already being done to try to make it safer, but it is not the silver bullet that takes a, a dangerous chemical like HF and makes it completely safe. And I think that's something that uh, most of us can agree on in terms of uh, the assessment. Uh, the, the second thing is uh, what's what, the other part of HF that uh, makes it dangerous is because of that low boiling point, it can form this dense cloud of droplets, this dense cl cloud that uh, doesn't dissipate as quickly as, say, a, a normal gas would, and, be and because it's dense, it could hug the ground a little more than another, uh, than another type of release would. Uh, so the question is whether the modification of the HF avoids that formation of the dense vapor cloud. And I think there's been some work done on that, and there's some suggestion it might uh, have some benefit there, but I would also say it's also very uncertain whether that modification at the levels it's being uh, done currently can say for certain that there would be no v uh, dense vapor cloud. And I'm happy to go into details at some point if we need to, but uh, I think the uncertainty is still there. And the reason is some of the tests uh, were done at different operating conditions, different temperatures, different sizes of breaches and different sizes of holes. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty whether uh, that, would, that would actually completely avoid that potential of a dense vapor cloud. Um, so what we're looking at now is 
even if you, again, give the best interpretation of the results of all the studies and you ignore all the uncertainties, the best case scenario with all of that, and then you add in all the other mitigation measures uh, that are already in place and assume they're all working as, as uh, desired, you, according to the refinery, you have an 89% reduction of the release of HF or 89% um, less HF being uh, uh, available to be emitted into the community. That still leaves that remaining 11%. And again, that's an uncertain number. Is it 89, is it 80, is it 70? There's a lot of uncertainty in that. So that 11% is still a big number in terms of what would be released. Because if there was a breach in a settler tank that has almost 50,000 uh, gallons, you're still talking, you know, on the order of 5,000 uh, gallons, uh, sorry, pounds released, uh, you know, assuming in kind of worst case it all gets released. So, there's still a residual risk there that uh, staff believes is important and needs to be addressed. Uh, so, so my, the one technical slide, and I just want to get into the, you know, our, 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 our assertion, and I think it's even the refinery's assertion that, that, you know, you get some benefit from the modified HF. So this is a, a graph based on lab tests and modeling that was done many years ago when the there was a patent for the modified HF solution. So you can see here, um, across, on the left is what's known as rain out, which is how much would, you know, kind of rain out to the ground and not be released, you know, as a gas. So you could see the red line is a 0% additive, which would be, uh, you know, a pure HF. And that, just pure HF alone has some rain out, so that would be around, you know, 17, 18%. You could see when they have 20% additive, according to this, you know, this study, you get about 30%. Uh, when you get up to 30% additive, this chart suggests you get a much, a much greater, um, a much greater rain out. But as you know, the refineries are running roughly around 7, 8% additive. Uh, so even if you kind of, next, next click. So even if you kind of give them that best fit line there uh, at about a 10%, I mean, at about a seven or eight percent additive, you get about a ten percent benefit. Next click. Uh, we have also have this data from uh, Torrance Refinery that's modeling only. It does not reflect necessarily uh, the lab test, but if you just use the modeling exercise, uh, that this this is what the airborne reduction factor is. An airborne reduction factor is a little different than rain out because it's really the percentage uh, benefit above a pure HF. So if you click again, you could see that, a, you know, 7, 8% additive, you get an ARF of about 50%, okay? But again, a pure HF has an ARF somewhere around 20%, so again, that's about a 30% benefit. So if you hit the next click, so kind of best case, if you take the, the model on the right at face value, you get about a 50% you know, uh, rain out versus a 20% rain out, 18% rain out, you get about a 35% benefit. So this is why we think, yeah, it's a good thing. It provides some level of mitigation. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty between that 10% benefit and 35% benefit. Next slide. So uh, staff has developed some initial rule concepts. We have not come up with rule language yet. We're still trying to work with the working groups on some rule concepts. Uh, on and we, what we're looking to do is, you know, avoid or minimize the risks due to HF. So we've come up with this idea that we can have these different tiers of mitigation for HF. And the first tier, uh, I'll go into some details, would require some enhancements to the current mitigation that exists at both facilities. Uh, so both facilities do have sensors, they have either water curtains or water cannons and, and acid detecting paint and other things that, that are helpful in reducing the risk. Uh, what we want to do in a, in a short time frame is maybe look at those best practices in a relatively low cost, you know, make sure that those are all tightened up and maybe borrow, uh, uh, bring both facilities kind of up to that same level. At tier two, uh, to go back, I'll, I'll get to the details. Uh, so on tier two, it's really above and beyond this. You know, American Petroleum Institute has a whole list of different types of mitigation measures, all of which aren't being used. So this would really be something that really go above and beyond and really try to get the, the risk levels down. And then tier three, which is much longer term, would be that you greatly enhance protection, which I'll talk about. Almost, you never get to fail safe, but as close to fail safe as possible. And 
if, if uh, you know, and these would only be required if HF or modified HF continues to be used because they would, you know, they would also have the option of changing to an alternative, whether it's sulfuric acid or one of the other alternatives. And, you know, when you get up to tier three mitigation, it is something that actually has not been done before in this setting. So obviously there'll have to be some decisions made. So next slide. Just real quick on these different tier one mitigations. These are just some of the things that are done at one refinery or the other or at both. And in, a, and in maybe a six to 12 month time frame for some cost, but relatively lower cost uh, for the stuff that is not in place, we think we can uh, provide some uh, short term extra level of protection in case something happened. Next slide. Uh, and when you get to tier two, it's a, more of kind of the all of the above approach of some of the mitigation measures that we know about that API has put out, more state-of-the-art cameras, automated systems, better HF sensors, more HF sensors, uh, more comprehensive barriers. Uh, so this could get expensive and we are thinking of a, you know, two to four year time frame on this. But again, if they switch to an alternative, these costs would would not be incurred and they could be used for, uh, you know, a, for the switch to an alternative. And next slide, when we get to tier three, and this is a newer concept that has not gone, you know, we did, have not presented this to the working group just yet, but the idea is staff has looked at some other situations where, where highly hazardous chemicals uh, are handled and used. Uh, we looked at uh, where they do have rail cars that come in with very toxic uh, chlorine gas. And there are standards and there are systems out there that essentially are essentially full enclosures with, with uh, other types of uh, complete containment systems. Uh, and uh, there are um, roll up doors, sensors, drainage capacities, flooding, all kinds of things that are done in that, those situations. Now, I know it has not been done at a refinery and it has not been done for an alkylation unit, but we think we could get creative and maybe, maybe come up with a way that this could be done uh, so there really is zero or near zero risk in terms of any type of accident. And in these other situations, they're really, you know, there's security measures, there's, they're really supposed to be like, there's, uh, almost, almost, you never get to zero risk, but really very, very, very low risk of anything happening. Now this could get expensive, it hasn't been done before, and there's challenges at the facilities in doing something like this, but it's a concept because we heard from everybody, including community members, is, you know, is there a way to make this ultimately completely safe? And the refineries are saying, is there a way we can continue to use the HF? We came up with this concept, again, it has not been attempted before. Um, Underground storage is possibly one, uh, another way you might be able to, um, to get towards what we're talking about here. But again, at some point, this may not be feasible and it may, it may require an alternative instead of going in this direction. So uh, next slide. So just a lay of the land, we have some overhead public, you know, Google type photos of uh, what, what's going on. So the reason we show this is that the different challenges that different refineries may have. So if you look at Torrance Refinery, it is a, over a large area um, and so they, there is some flexibility about, you know, modifications. If they did want to build uh, an alternative unit, if they did want to build kind of this super containment system, they have some opportunities for some parallel construction and it's not, you know, it's not easy but there are, is space to uh, minimize downtime and, and work on some of these things we've talked about. You could, could go through a click or two. There's the ESP, next click, uh, and that is uh, the uh, alkylation unit. You could see the settler tanks, the blast wall, and this is again where that near miss happened uh, a couple years ago. Next slide. Uh, and then Valero, and the challenge at Valero is you can see it's much more compact, it's space constrained. Uh, so if Valero was gonna make a switch, or Valero was going to do a containment system, uh, it would be more challenging to, to build things in parallel. It might require more downtime. Uh, but again, we could, we could try to get creative, but there are some more challenges of Valero in terms of uh, uh, having to make a, a switch. Uh, next slide. You could see a very small footprint in the alkylation unit. It's actually oriented vertically rather than horizontally. Next, next slide. Uh, so when we look at the alternatives to HF, and we know sulfuric acid is one of the alternatives, uh, we, we did talk to a lot of the, the, the licensors of different technologies, uh, and we were trying to look at costs. 
Um, so the, on Sulfuric, we, there's a couple different companies out there that have some systems that um, are, they're, they're at least uh, proposing that are a little bit cheaper than just building an entire new sulfuric acid where you can use some of the old components. Obviously, there's a lot of changes that would have to happen as well, but they think they have some solutions for sulfuric acid conversion, con conversion <coughs> that are not the same as just building it from scratch. So you get like maybe 30, 60 percent less. But again, some of these things are relatively new, things to be explored. Uh, you know, the CD Alki technology has, um, has, uh, has been applied to one unit in the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's scheduled to come up at, in 2020. Uh, the convex has not been used yet. Anyway, other than sulfuric acid, the, the two alternatives that are maturing, you know, slowly like technology sometimes does, is the solid acid and the ionic liquid. Uh, we really don't have cost information yet. Uh, there are no known hazards that we know of now. Um, and they have been deployed. There's a petrochemical uh, plant in China. It is lower capacity. Uh, it is a chemical plant, although it is an alkylation unit. Uh, and then the isoalkyl technology has been demonstrated in, in Salt Lake City by Chevron, and they have a planned uh, scale up to production levels by 2020 at 5,000 barrels per day. Next slide. So again, we don't have the costs on the other alternatives, the non-sulfuric acid alternatives. The costs we're putting here are the costs as the district has received them from various assessments. There's no district jurying in or, or questioning of these costs at this point. If we have, if we move forward and we have rule language, it'll be much, that's the time we will dig in with the specific provisions of the rule. We will be able to go in deeply into the cost. So this is just what's been presented to us. So Norton Engineering, you know, years ago in the study came up with a cost range of 100 to 200 million. That it, we acknowledge that was for the U.S. Gulf Coast. It was for Gulf Coast labor prices. Uh, it was the alkylation, alkylation unit only with no regeneration. So that's probably on the low end. Uh, when we talk about DuPont's technology, uh, we could, we, the, the discount rate they kind of gave, to, if they can use some of the existing uh, equipment, uh, they think they could do it, you know, it, it comes out for about a 23,000 uh, barrels per day. Uh, to about 200 to 300 million. Again, these are just based on what we've heard with some factors applied. <laughs> and then the, the Torrance refinery has put forward numbers in the 600 to 900 million range, depending on whether they do, uh, and that, depending whether they do sulfuric acid generation on site or have to move sulfuric acid in and out of the facility, uh, which of course has the, the, uh, the issue of the trucking, the trucks and the trucking emissions and things like that of the tankers. So potential timing, and I mentioned some of this before, again, uh, the rule is now on the calendar for July. Uh, so after this committee meeting, depending on what we hear from the public and the committee, we'll be working on uh, a, a path forward. Uh, the f tier one mitigation uh, is, we're looking at about a six to 12 month time frame. The tier two mitigation or some other alternative technology we're looking at a two to three year time frame, but again, this is subject to rulemaking. We could, what exactly is required in tier one or tier two or tier three for that matter would be a subject of the rulemaking going forward. Uh, and then eight years after adoption, uh, we're looking at this, you know, this super uh, containment close to fail safe system or an alternative technology it could be applied at any point in here. And then the requirements of uh, the enhanced mitigation would obviously uh, be lessened. Uh, so, and the reason we chose eight years is roughly because what we're hearing is that if there was going to even be a sulfuric acid conversion and you consider turnaround uh, schedules that we're hearing roughly, you know, about seven years that it would take at, at a lot of cost. Uh, but we thought if we gave a little more time, maybe there's a little more time for the alternatives to mature and maybe there's some, either some cost savings or some safety savings if one of those new alternatives is used instead of sulfuric acid. Uh, Embedded within here is a check back where we could do a more, uh, uh, we could do a, uh, an assessment as those alternatives advance, the, the solid acid and the ionic liquid advance over the next couple, couple years as their production comes up in 2020 in Salt Lake City, we get a better idea of the costs involved. We can complete a, uh, an assessment of cost and feasibility of those technologies as a check-in to see whether, uh, you know, the rule 
provisions that, we, that, that eventually get adopted are still appropriate after you have that check-in. Next slide. That's it. All right. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fine. You know, it's, uh, everyone says to me I have the most enviable job it is, and that is to navigate how we get across this divide of community concerns, industry concerns, and also what is available to us relative to our jurisdiction, and that is to give you the assurances that we're concerned about what the quality itself of any kind of in pollutant, chemical, whatever it may be, that is emitted and, uh, into the air. That's what we're here for, and that's why we're here today, to show, and ex show to you that for the last year, our staff has been diligently working with industry groups and industry as a whole to make sure that uh, we come up with a sustainable alternative uh, to basically just ensure all of those goals and meet all those goals that Dr. Fine has talked about here today. As you can see, it's, a, it's an arduous process, one that takes a long, long period of time in order to be able to do it. And when I say a long period of time, I'm really talking about the various different processes that we have to go through. That is from rulemaking to environmental, uh, CEQA uh, actions. Those things themselves may sound simple to state, but they're very complex to do. So all of you probably are very well aware in the 1990s when uh, we had a very similar kind, kind of concern in Torrance and ended up Superior Court, and it ended up in a consent decree where the parties themselves agreed to do certain things that would make it hydrogen fluoride less hazardous. We basically agreed to put a modification into it, and that was put in suffering sulfur type of solvent that would basically make it less likely to be uh, form a vapor in the air. Didn't do the total job at, but at that point in time. It was an agreement that was done. And then 2015 came along with the big explosion. Many of you then began to uh, realize that that was probably one of the greatest hazards that could be open into this community. And then we began to have a various different other incidents that brought about concerns uh, for everyone, the industry as a whole, and for our agency, and for you as residents, and that's when we came back into action, and that's why we're here today. Uh, we have one of our your representatives, uh, Assembly Manel Maratucci, that would like to come and give a you know a a, a particular his comments itself relative to why we're here today and what he would like to uh, add to the to this process. Assemblyman, welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Parker, and uh, members of the AQMD board for allowing me to speak. I was, am scheduled to uh, speak at the Women's March uh, taking place in the South Bay in Redonda Beach, uh, and I need to head over there, but uh, I appreciate the accommodation to be able to uh, participate in this very, very important hearing that you are conducting today. You know, I have the privilege of representing uh, Torrance and the South Bay in the California State Assembly. Uh, I've lived, I, I lived in Torrance for over 20 years, and in fact, when the explosion happened in February of 2015. Uh, my wife, my daughter, and I lived just a few miles away from the refinery. And so this issue is a personal issue for me, but from the very beginning, I have always emphasized the same message that I emphasize here today, which is, you know, the, I don't want to see the refinery shut down. I just want to see the refinery safer. 
I want to see the refinery safe for all the children, all the families that live in the immediate vicinity of the refinery, the schools that are located uh, in, in the immediate vicinity of the refinery. I want to make the refinery safer. And so that is what I've always tried to emphasize. I know there are a lot of people here in, you know, from the refinery who are employed by the refinery. Many people that work at the Torrance refinery live in Torrance and in the South Bay. I don't want to see their jobs lost. There are great jobs at the refinery. There are great union jobs at the refinery. And I want to make sure that we, those jobs are protected. But at the same time, this, Dr. Parker, as you indicated, this issue has been haunting the community ever since 1990. The community is deeply concerned with this highly toxic chemical, hydrofluoric acid, being used in just two refineries in Torrance. I know there are folks here with uh, Valero also. The Wilmington community is in the same situation. And so I want to thank Dr. Nastry, Dr. Fine, and your entire staff for all your hard work, the entire AQMD for your thoughtful, you know, open process that you've been conducting for months. Uh, you, you laid out, summarized all the hearings, the working group uh, efforts, everyone in the community, the refinery workers, everyone has had a, uh, an opportunity to participate and to, to provide their input uh, in this very important but very divisive issue. And so I want to thank the entire AQMD staff, the entire AQMD board for taking such a thoughtful process because, you know, ultimately we need to strike a balance between how to keep the refinery going, how to, to keep, protect the jobs, but at the same time, protecting our children, protecting our families in the community of Torrance and throughout the South Bay. And so I thank you so much for this very thoughtful and deliberative process. And I'm asking each and every one of you to think about the children, to think about the families, to think about the workers. And I ask you to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Yeah! Assemblyman, Assemblyman. Assemblyman, before you leave, I'm confused. Do you want to ban HF or not? No, you can't answer. You can't answer. You can't answer for him. You can't. You cannot answer for him. He can answer for him. I'm uh, because in one one moment you're saying you know uh, the safety of the community, and the next moment. You're talking about uh, keep the jobs. So I, I just got confused. Uh, are, are you saying we should ban HF? Well, this issue, again, uh, is very complicated, and there are strong feelings on both sides of the issue. As someone who has lived in the community for many years, I would like to see HF banned. But at the same time, I don't want to see the refinery having to shut down. And so, <laughs> so you know, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to weigh which response I get a bigger applause on here. You know, this is obviously a very complicated issue with strong emotions on both sides. You know, as someone who's lived in the community, again, you know, ideally, we don't want this highly toxic chemical in our community. And, you know, that, that, is, that is the bottom line. We want to protect, we want, we want to protect our children and families living in the community. I don't have, I don't have the expertise that the AQMD has. I, I, I don't have the, the army of uh, scientists and engineers and industry consultants that you have. And that is why I am asking you to do the right thing here. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Assemblyman. I think we have another representative from uh, Supervisors Janice Hahn's office, Matt Johnson. Would you uh, come to the microphone, please? You can, why don't you come to this microphone here? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the hearing board. On behalf of Supervisor Janice Hahn, I'd like to thank the members of the community who attended the various working groups held by the AQMD in the last year. From the beginning, Supervisor Hahn has believed that banning MHF is the best solution. In March 2017, she led her colleagues on the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors in sending a five-signature letter to the South Coast AQMD supporting the proposed rule banning MHF. The Torrance Refinery is and will continue to be a good source of jobs in our communities. There is no reason why a safer alternative to MHF should not be implemented. We cannot afford another near miss. The su supervisor believes that a ban on MHF will accelerate the development of new and safer alternatives and will ultimately result in the adoption of one that is safer for our communities and safer for our workers. I appreciate the South Coast AQMD and this board in particular for taking this matter seriously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, who's going to... Uh, oh, I can't see the timer. That's, can you push that over a little bit so that I can see it? I am having... Oh, let me move my side. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it now. And it's going to be two minutes per person. By the time we do that, we have, uh, we have way in excess of probably 125 people who want to speak. Uh, in, in order to hear what everyone has to say, and that is not including that of our uh, board members who would basically, you quite sure would be interested in what they would have to say. And before we basically give our, uh, I should say, comments and observations of exactly uh, what has transpired today, we need to hear what you have to say as well. So as you can see, Dr. Burke, recognizing that uh, Assemblyman Maratucci would not be here, wanted to find out what was his position itself as it relates to this particular process. So our first speaker that we have. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Can you explain to me his position? I still don't understand. <laughs> so it looks like Fred Astaire to me. I mean, you know, you know, he loves everybody, but you know, he can't go home with everybody. So I didn't understand a thing he said. Well, I, I can't. <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. It was a rhetorical question. I know we have a lot of testimony. I'll keep my mouth shut. Okay. That being said, we will move along in order to get to uh, our speakers. We have two microphones, and I'm going to call out uh, three or four people's names, and in the order where you're sitting on whatever side, you can line up so that we can get this process uh, uh, flowing and we won't have to wait for someone to come from the back of the room up to speak. The first four speakers uh, will be in this order. Mark Fair, Steve, I guess this is Stretch, Stretch, uh, Steve. Okay. Uh, Madison Mizra and Tommy Fava. Okay, Steve. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, good morning. Go uh, good morning, Chairman. I uh, want to thank uh, 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak can, today. I want to thank you. Can we get the microphone here. up yes. uh, so that it can Good, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Fair. I'm the uh, refinery manager at the Woman Refinery. I want to thank everybody for being here. In particular, I want to thank the uh, Valero uh, employees and contractors that are here and their family members. As the nation's premier refiner, Valero is an industry leader in maintaining safe, stable, and reliable operations. The Valero Wilmington Refinery is one of two refineries in California that are recognized as Cal OSHA as star sites. Designations given on the basis of inspe extensive inspections to recognize facilities that go above and beyond regulatory requirements. The only other refinery in California to have the same recognition is Valero's Benicia, California refinery. We take our responsibilities to our employees and our community seriously. We take pride in how we inspect, maintain, and operate our alkyl revamp and other process units to identify and prevent potential releases before they occur. Our performance speaks for itself. Valero has operated the present HF alkylation unit for over 35 years without an off-site incident, including over nine years with modified HF, during which time we have experienced earthquakes, electrical outages, and extreme weather conditions. In 2003, Valero and the South Coast Air District entered in a memorandum of understanding. Valero agreed to end the use of concentrated HF at the Women's Refinery and install a reduced volatility alkylation process, better known as REVAP. The district found and stated repeatedly in the MOU that this commitment meets the district's objective to significantly reduce the potential risks associated with accidental releases. In exchange for Malera's commitment to voluntarily undertake this project, the district agreed not to take further actions to regulate the use of HF. Valero has complied in good faith with the MOU ever since. Valero has spent over $200 million in constructing and op safely operating the Alkyl Revamp system and implementing numerous measures to assure Excuse equipment me. integrity and rapid detection and response if the relation would occur. Yes. Time is run. Right. In order to... Steve, Steve Stech, please. I'm Steve Stech, the Torrance Refinery Manager, and I proudly represent 900 employees and contractors who work at the refinery. Many of you are here today. And another 15 please, indirect please. jobs oh, for each refinery worker. Stop the clock. If we continue to demonstrate like that, the chairman has asked you not to do that. We would appreciate very much if you wouldn't do that, because if you continue to do that, what we're going to have to do is clear the room and bring people in to testify one at a time, and I don't want to do that, and I'm sure he doesn't want to do that. So can we hold the demonstrations down? We know, we know that everybody is emotionally involved in this, so just bear with us, please. We produce transportation fuels critical to sustaining your quality of life. We have an estimated $7 billion impact on the California economy. Since we acquired the refinery over 18 months ago, we've made major improvements to our equipment and our culture. We put a new organization in place focusing on experience, technical knowledge, and operating capability. We created a new refinery training and program focused on operating competency and capability. We successfully executed a major turnaround and invested more than $250 million in our equipment, and we're working with the district on a project to reduce flaring. We're committed to improving the reliability of our electrical system from Southern California Edison. We're committed to using highly trained, qualified union workers, most steel workers, building trades, many of them here who are here today, and we're hiring another 20 operators who believe in the refinery's future. Um, simply put, Torrance is a different refinery today. We're proud of our progress and will continue to operate safely, reliably, and environmentally responsibly. Since we took control, we've been committed to improving our MHF alkylation unit. We participated in the 1410 rulemaking group. We've worked collaboratively and openly to make sure rulemaking is based on sound science and technology. And we provided staff with all the information that proves MHF permits the formation of an aerosol and promotes rain out 
at our operating conditions. Much of this was reviewed by the staff when they permitted our unit in 1997. Uh, we agree with you that this is a complex subject, but based on the presentation, it looks like you still don't understand how MHF works. You left out some of the most important concepts, the polarity of the molecules involved that promotes hydrogen bonding, which allows large droplets to form and fall to the ground, and the presence of water I was, I was promised four minutes because I'm representing a large group of people, and I, and I have some important things to say. The, the, the uh, presence of water, which allows, which is three times more effective than the additive. That, that concludes your testimony. Uh, you're going to conclude? Yeah. Well, let me just Next, say, please. let me just, I just, one, one minute closing. Thank you for your comments. We're supportive of the I tier think, one think, and three. No, we can't, we can't allow that because if we do, we'll be here until two or three weeks from now for everyone to um, do it. So uh, uh, our next speaker. Uh, uh, will be, now, uh, now, you know you can applaud, but you go, those that are applauding are going to ruin it for everybody. Ms. Ra? Tommy Favai. OK, where is uh, Manish? There was that Minish Misra. Minish Misra. It's a young child. It's not here. Okay. Uh, Tony, Tommy, please proceed. Good morning, Dr. Parker and members of the AQMD uh, Refinery Committee Board. My name is Tommy Falvai. I represent IBEW Local 11. On behalf of our membership that's behind us, um, that's here currently working um, here in the Torrance and, and uh, Valero and Wilmington and South Bay refineries. Um, we urge to uh, oppose any ban or phase out of MHF on potential points to make. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to make it clear today that uh, we are in support on, on, on uh, leaving these refineries open because we represent these workers that work in the refineries and with inclusions of project labor agreements, uh, we want to have those uh, um, careers uh, long lasting. And just to, just to talk about the industry and how it affects the industry, you're talking about the port, the port of LA, uh, LA Basin, all the South Bay refineries. This will affect a lot of the industry when it comes to good construction jobs. And I'm here to urge you to oppose any uh, H, uh, HF or MHF uh, ban. Thank you. Okay. The next, <clears throat> next four speakers uh, line up are Mary Pope, Jim Cooksey, Rebecca Potter, and uh, Linda Bria. Lydia. Lydia Bria. Okay. Mary Pope. I am a new resident in Torrance. Can you give your name, please? I'm sorry, I'm Mary Pope. I recently moved to Torrance and uh, to be near my grandchildren. Uh, when I arrived, I started to hear uh, other citizens in Torrance talk about the refinery and the danger. I was very concerned, and as a concerned citizen and a responsible citizen, I felt I, I need to do something uh, to uh, make it safe for my grandchildren, but not only my grandchildren, for all the workers and the families who live in the area. So I joined TRAA. There is where I really learned the scientific facts about um, MHF. So I, I will make this short, but I, I just don't understand. Even, I know workers have families, and they have children, and they have parents, and even though I, I feel that the health and the safety of the community will is, supersedes um, jobs because I feel the jobs will be there. Even through a transition, the jobs will remain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Next, uh, Jim. Yeah, my name is Jim Cooksey. I represent the Boilermakers in the state of California. Uh, I'd like to thank you fellows for the opportunity to speak today. We, as Boilermakers, fought hard to get our trained, qualified people in these refineries for years. We finally achieved that factor. 
We came into uh, PBF refinery with, uh, or with PBF before ExxonMobil left. Uh, I personally was on the shutdown they had uh, at PBF and v witnessed some of the, how can I say it, haphazard methods that were used by ExxonMobil. I can s vouch right here and now for PBF. PBF went in, fixed this plant, made this plant fully operational again. It's actually at record levels as far as production right now. And they're using union personnel to maintain and keep up this refinery, which is people that live in this neighborhood, that live in this area, that pay taxes, their kids go to school, they buy cars here, they buy groceries here, they pay mortgages here. It, it is a huge, huge part of this, or this neighborhood to keep it going is this refinery. So uh, the Boilermakers strongly oppose any M -H MFH uh, bands or whatever, what is it? MHF, I get mixed up. But, uh, and, and like I say, I've been around this stuff for 40 years and uh, seen very, very little accidents in this stuff. So and with that, I'd like to say thank you and uh, we strongly oppose this. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Reba Potter. Hi, I'm Rebecca Potter, okay. and I'm a new resident of oh, Northwest Torrance. Um, I want to mention a couple things that I think we should consider if we're considering fail-safe as an option, because I don't think you can ever really fail-safe something like MHF. Um, first, regarding a uh, possible terrorist attack, I was reading a 2005 report from the Public Interest Research Group, which stated that refineries using hydrofluoric acid and MHF are a potential target for terror attacks, due to the high, particularly if they're in high-density locations. This is because you essentially get the power of a chemical weapon without any of the work needed to develop one. Most of my life has been in a post-9-11 world, and I was living in the Boston area when the Sarnaya brothers bombed the marathon. I do not want to bet thousands of lives on this never happening here. We cannot expect the refinery, however responsible and hardworking they are, to safeguard against a suicide attack or cheaply available drones tied to explosives. We are standing in the backyard of the Southern California defense industry. This is an industry that spends billions of dollars a year developing technologies we hope we never have to use to safeguard our national security but we're unwilling to spend even a fraction of that price to convert the refineries and remove this back door where a lone wolf could kill tens of thousands of people. Second, we know that Southern California is earthquake prone. The refineries might say that a very severe magnitude earthquake is unlikely and we don't need to necessarily plan for that. It's certainly very difficult to design any system to withstand something of sufficient magnitude. But my family members in Houston, Sonoma, Santa Barbara, and Ventura County would probably have something to say about assuming that historic and unlikely natural disasters will never occur. We cannot continue to bet thousands of lives on this. It is not that high of a price tag for the number of lives that are endangered. Thank you. Next person, Lydia. Uh, I don't know what this means. Lydia Bree in Britain. Lydia Bree. McMark? Lydia Bree. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'd first like to introduce myself. I've been a member of this community for nearly 60 years. And my house, my church, all of the activities that I participate in are within view of the refinery every day. I walk on the grounds of the refinery. I walk next to the refinery. I request that the decisions be based on fact. Let's look carefully at the facts. HF has been in our community for over 50 years. We have safely coexisted with HF for those times. We've heard all the safety precautions that have been implemented at the plant. I, as a simple community member, give the analogy of cars. When I was a child, we didn't wear seat belts, and then we had lap belts, and then we had shoulder belts, and now we have airbags, and now we have cars that drive themselves and protect. I see the same thing happening at the refinery. With HF, I'm sure there's step after step of precautions that are taken. And I think those will continue to evolve over the years and that we can have this and have safety at the same time. I don't know if any of you have talked to the workers and the facility 
and the engineers that are there, but they are America's brightest and best. And taking time and opportunity to talk to those people that can explain this is really something else. Because I was nothing but impressed with the workers and the passion and the scientific knowledge behind each of those people. So please base your decisions on fact. The refinery does provide jobs. The refinery provides products that all of us getting here today have used. So take that time, because there's thousands and thousands of people that are involved here. And the loudest voices, the negative voices, those are not the entire community. Let's go forward with balance and reason and work together to solve a position and a problem, or maybe not even a problem, but something that will be best for everybody involved. Next, four, next four speakers, Jake Claffin, Steve Dillo, Melanie Cohen, and Adam Webb. Jake? My name is Jake Clapham. I live in a neighboring community. I work in the city of Torrance. Uh, first, Dr. Berg, I, I appreciate uh, your, your direction in, in uh, taking command of the meeting and, and in some of your humor in dealing with uh, or inter interaction with uh, Representative Marisucci. I did hear uh, in, in uh, Mr. Marisucci's comments, or maybe what he was trying to get out, what I would think is that there is a, it's not a bilateral decision. There is a third road, and that's to manage the risk in place. And my, my comments echo those of the last speaker in that there's a lot of engineering. There was a lot of engineering that was pointed out in the AQMD presentation. A lot of tools in place to make sure that, uh, that modified hydrofluoric acid is controlled and it does stay in place and it doesn't get in the community and it isn't evolving situation. There are a lot of similar chemicals, uh, as was pointed out in the AQMD presentation, like chlorine. There are a lot of regulations already in place that are enforced by other agencies that uh, ensure safety. And I would ask you to please consider all of those, those means and methods and to treat HF as we do all of the other hazardous chemicals that are present in Southern California and are utilized as you make your decisions. Thank you. Steve Dillow, thank you very much. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Steve Dillow. I'm a 35-year resident of West Torrance, and I uh, felt it was really safe up until three years ago <clears throat> when, when they had the explosion. My house, lawn, everything was covered by the ashes that day, so, so I know I was in the kill zone if that projectile had gone six feet further and ruptured the tank. So. Now I'm worried about it. I'm, I'm really concerned about HF. I'm also very upset with the city. They had no monitoring devices. They had no emergency plans in place. If something, if it did happen, there's no main means of notifying us or evacuating us if, if anything really happened. I think some of that, thanks to Assemblyman Marasucci, has is taking place now. But uh, some of the monitoring devices and alarm systems, they. Uh, but I, I know the refinery is safer now. I know the uh, Chemical Safety Board fined Exxon Mobil a lot of money because of what they did and the way they ran the refinery. But also, a year ago in November, the EPA came in and had inspections and found lots of violations also. It is better, but the biggest difference is Torrance Alert System doesn't notify us anymore. Of when these things happen. So I really think we need to get rid of MHF in any case. But I want to emphasize, you won't hear anyone from TRAA or anyone else saying we want the refinery to shut down or that we want jobs to be lost. And I can't believe that's, that would happen anyway. After the explosion three years ago, ExxonMobil found a buyer right away they sold it at a loss, probably. But there are billions of dollars worth of pipelines from that refinery. I can't believe that PDF, PPF, if they want to leave, 
Thank they couldn't find your, any thank buyer. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Melanie Cohen? Yes, Melanie Cohen, TR, sorry, TRAA, Ban MHF. I have stood in front of this commission a few times, and I'm here again today. While I appreciate the work you're doing, it's too slow. We've already had two major accidents at this facility. It's a dangerous chemical. We have an opportunity here to switch to other chemicals. We have an opportunity here to save lives. I am a daughter. I am an auntie. I am a great aunt. I am a coworker. I am a person who has been affected by this MHF. I am a very healthy individual, except for the last few years. I have never had bone problems. I have never had other problems before the refineries exploded. I had a very bad shoulder separation last September and a breakage and I am now going to several doctors to try and determine why my bones are having so much problem. I appreciate what your doctor said, but I also need you all to understand we need to ban this chemical because of the amount of other chemicals that we use within our environment. We need to keep Torrance, Redondo Beach, Palos Verdes, Gardena, Wilmington, West LA, Santa Monica, Hermosa Beach, Manhattan Beach. It depends where the wind will blow at the next accident. So please heed this and remember your families and friends. Thank you, Ban MHF. Yes. Uh, next four after this uh, next speaker, Donna Heiss, Marie, Wright and Logan Bagley and Amanda Flores. Adam Webb. Uh, thank you, Refinery Committee. Uh, my name is Adam Webb. I'm a senior engineer at the Torrance Refinery. Uh, I've been the refinery representative on the 1410 rulemaking committee. I uh, had the privilege of working very closely with staff over the past uh, nine months to a year to look at the efficacy of MHF and its ability to stop the formation of a dense aerosol cloud at the operations and conditions used at the Torrance Refinery. I wanted to address one misstatement around the amount of MHF that would be released in the district's presentation, uh, saying that 11% would still be released even if all mitigation measures were in place. Uh, this 11% refers to only the passive mitigations we have in place at the refinery. We also have very many redundant active mitigations as well that are in use and have been explained to the district staff, many of which were actually listed under the Tier 1 uh, mitigation measures. And these combination of these active, passive mitigations, such as the MHF chemistry in the barriers, as well as the active mitigations, such as water mitigation and the acid evacuation system, have effectively stopped any release from the unit from getting off site since the unit was constructed in 1966. That's 51 years ago. And the analogy that was used earlier of a car is actually a good analogy. HF and MHF use the refinery have been consistently updated and the safety systems have been consistently updated over the past 50 plus years. And we uh, look forward to and are willing to continue working with the AQMD and the staff uh, cooperatively on enhanced mitigation systems that will effectively continue to provide safety uh, mitigation and risk mitigation to the workers and the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Donna? Heiss? I'm Donna Heiss. I live about four blocks from the refinery and I've lived there since 1972. I believe I've spoken before this group before. Um, I want to remind you of the governor's report that came out uh, from the Richmond refinery fire. And one particular sentence struck me. It's not we should not consider the economic consequences of the refinery, or of, we should 
put safety first, no matter the cost. <coughs> so please remember that. And I would like to thank Torrance Refinery for being so much safer than ExxonMobil. <coughs> and since the beginning of the year, the noise has really reduced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. The next uh, person is Marie Wright. Hello, my name is Marie Wright and I work for PBF Energy. I'm one of our directors. Um, and actually I would like to continue on with um, Steve Steech's comments. As Adam Webb said, we are you know, wanting to work with the agency here with the tiered approach. Um, we are encouraged by the focus on enhancing safety systems. We believe that we can work collaboratively with the staff on tier one and tier twos. However, one size doesn't fit all. Potentially safety enhancements that might be suitable for Wilmington may be inappropriate for Torrance. To account for this, we recommend that Tier 2 include the requirements that both refineries submit individual safety enhancement plans to the district. These plans would include enhancements that are feasible, improve safety, reduce risk, and are cost effective for each respective refinery. These enhancements would be also consistent with the American Petroleum Institute's recommended practice 751. Considering the safety enhancements provided by Tier 2 and Tier 3, we're unsure what, if any, benefits Tier 3 would provide. Tier 3 options are, prevent, are presented could actually introduce significantly more risk. Requiring enclosure to cover the entire MH alkylation unit or some portion of it would create a confined space. Hydrocarbons could accumulate, creating a highly explosive and flammable environment. This would increase personnel and process safety risk. Before proceeding with the Tier 3 concept, it must be thoroughly vetted to make sure it is feasible, improves safety, reduces risk, and is cost effective. Most concerning is what if there is no feasible Tier 3 safety enhancement option? As proposed by staff, the Torrance and Wilmington refineries would be forced to phase out MHF with an alternate alkylation technology. Sulfuric acid is not any safer than MHF. It will increase emissions and energy consumption. It's cost prohibitive. It would cost us about $900 million, including spent acid regeneration. Presentations by licensors clearly Thank indicate that comments. other alternatives are not Thank viable. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Logan Bagby. Good morning. My name is Logan Bagby. I'm here today as a community member and resident of Torrance. Uh, there has been a small portion of the community with a very loud voice who do not re represent the community at large. Less than 3% of the Torrance population is represented by the activist group leading the ban efforts on MHF. A ban or phase out of MHF would negatively impact the city of Torrance and the surrounding cities. There would be numerous jobs lost and a significant decrease in revenue for the city and surrounding cities. The gasoline market in California continues to have some of the strictest regulations which cause the cost per gallon to be more dependent on production locally than anywhere else in the country. Any reduction or shutdown of a California refinery would impact every resident with a higher cost per gallon of gasoline and a significant increase in cost of goods due to increased transportation costs. Torrance was originally founded as a balanced city managing residential, industrial, and commercial interest. Any ban or phase out of MHF would likely cause another large corporate business to leave the city of Torrance. I respectfully urge the governing board to oppose any ban or phase out of MHF, which would negatively impact our entire community to appease a very small percentage of residents. In closing, I would like to state the TRAA does not represent me as a lifelong community member. Thank you. The next four speakers to line up, uh, Jeff Fitt, Brad Jensen, Al Sattler, Sattler. Uh, I was called, uh, Armando Eric Flores. Eric Myers. Armando Flores. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Armando Flores with the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, VICA. We represent businesses uh, all across Southern California. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on this very important issue. Uh, we are here today to urge you to oppose the ban or any such phase out of MHF. This ban would have a tremendous impact that would be felt across the states. It will affect families who depend on these refinery jobs, uh, employees in other industries that use MHF and businesses that need gasoline to conduct daily operations. 
California residents and businesses who cannot afford to pay the higher price of gasoline will struggle to pay for other life necessities. Uh, for many years, MHF has been safely used by California refineries to produce California's clean burning fuels. Uh, banning MHF could cause a shutdown of two refineries here in Southern California, uh, Valero and uh, P, uh, PB. Uh, because of the need to demolish to create infrastructure for new technology, a process that can take years and something that's never done, been done before. As you know and have heard before, gasoline prices uh, are expected to increase by 26 cents per gallon, uh, and California will lose about 30 percent of its gas supply. This is a high price to pay, uh, sorry, a high price to pay that will have extreme ramifications. We urge you to oppose proposed rule 1410. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Fitt. Thank you, committee. Would, you, the, would the other person come over to the other microphone, please? Uh, be able to make it over. Brad? Right. Oh, it's hard for them to do. Oh, it's hard for them to get around? Okay. Hello, my name is Jeff Fitt. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm an alkylation consultant. I've worked on HF, sulfuric acid, and MHF units for the last 40 years. I've engineered water systems the inventory systems, isolation systems. I've been associated with 751 assessments both in the United States and around the world. I was a key contributor to the initial 751 assess or, uh, document that came out of the EPA report to Congress where it was found that the risks of <coughs> alkylation units can be uh, adequately addressed with process safety management. I was a key contributor on the last four updates to 751. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the section six, the mitigation. There's three requirements in it. The first is that all sites need to have water, they all need to have detection, and some way to manage the event, basically the inventory system. Beyond that, uh, the document asks for sites to evaluate what you've done and is it adequate. If not, put more items in. And as Marie said, unit configurations are all different. Everything doesn't apply. Section 6 has a lot of tools in it. You basically pick what's most effective and make sure that they don't interfere with each other. One point that the uh, Tier 1 suggests is water curtains. For water mitigation systems, spray cannons are the first choice. They give you the flexibility to shoot directly at a release or provide a wide angle. Water curtains are very effective, however, they don't give you that flexibility. So your first choice is always water cannons. The, the other in the enclosures, LPG unit, alkylation unit is an LPG unit. And as part of the initial committee, we talked about cannons or enclosures. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Greg Jensen. Good morning. I'm Brad Jensen. I'm with the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership. We are a regional business organization covering the 31 cities in eastern Los Angeles County. I'd like to thank the AQMD board and this committee for their initiative and concern on behalf of public safety. Hydrofluoric acid and, its, and modified hydrofluoric acid must be handled and used under strict safety measures to ensure there is no risk to the public. The San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership believes PR 1410 should aim at ensuring proper safety measures are in place and are followed rather than fully banning hydrofluoric or modified hydrofluoric acid. According to the California Energy Commission, banning modified hydrofluoric acid could lead to two South Bay refineries to cease operations. Losing these two refinery facilities would most likely cause thousands of people to lose their jobs and it could cause a significant increase in gasoline prices for millions of Southern California working families. A major increase in gas prices would have a very negative effect on our region. A significant portion of the San Gabriel Valley economy is tied to distribution, warehousing and logistics. This is due to the presence of two major industrial cities in the region, Irwindale and Industry, which are far closer to Los Angeles and other major population centers than the Inland Empire. This is extremely important due to first mile, last mile delivery leading companies to place distribution centers in the region rather than elsewhere. While industry has a low population, it is the center of employment for 65,000 people. 
According to a regional economic report by LADC, in 2015, the city of Pasadena generated $26 billion in, in total economic output, followed by the city of industry at $17 billion in the San Gabriel Valley. An increase in gas prices would jeopardize our competitive advantage and endanger important jobs for working families in the region. A loss of these two refineries would also affect the cost and availability of jet fuel. This is critically important for the revitalization of Ontario Airport, which has recently returned to local control. Ontario has worked hard to increase passenger traffic. Thank you traffic. for your testimony. Thank you very much. Al Sattler. Good morning. Good morning to the members of the Refinery Committee of the AQMD Board. My name is Al Sattler. I am the chair of the local Sierra Club group. The Sierra Club is one of the groups that signed on to the uh, well-written environmental justice letter, which you should, should have received by now. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people in this area would be at risk if there were a major leak of hydrofluoric acid, HF, from one of these refineries, depending on which way the wind blew. Uh, I'm speaking about hydrofluoric acid rather than so-called modified hydrofluoric acid, because if there were, heaven forbid, a leak or ruptured tank, the hydrofluoric acid would boil off, leaving the modifier mostly behind. And then the hydrofluoric acid plume would be flowing into our community. The danger from refinery hydrofluoric acid has gone on for far too long. The suggested timeline for action on the last page of the AQMD report is entirely too extended. The, darn, just a sec. The Tier 1 measures, such as they are, should have been in place long ago. As the staff presentation shows, the Tier 2 measures would be in accord with the recommendations of the API, the American Petroleum Institute. These measures also should have been done years ago just to bring these refineries up to industry standards. If these refineries want to show they care about community safety, they should implement both Tier 1 and Tier 2 measures as soon as possible without waiting for any rule from the AQMD. That being said, even with Tier 1 and 2 measures in place, the hydrofluoric acid would still be there. A major relief of hydrofluoric acid would still kill thousands, if not tens of thousands of people in our community. For true community safety, these refineries must convert to a safer technology. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Uh, next, uh, would the following line up, uh, Luis Fleming, Ted Jimenez, Megan Hayati, and Richard Slauson. Mr. Myers. It's Eric Myers with Valero. I'm principal engineer at the refinery, also a member of the working group. And Valero appreciates the opportunity to participate in the working group, as well as an opportunity to speak here again today. So there was rec uh, references to API 751. A previous speaker referenced the uh, different tools in the toolbox. What uh, wasn't emphasized in the staff presentation was that that's the industry guidance and really the Bible for safety or risk mitigation within alkylation units, and that both refineries pretty much adhere to all the expectations within that um, document. The staff also notes that uh, alternative technologies have matured. I would say that's infinitesimal as far as the degree of maturity of alternative technologies. Much work is still required to advance those technologies. They're not at scale. They haven't been used in the United States. And for those to be commercially proven, they're many years out, 10 plus years out before one can really state that those are viable technologies. Um, there's also, uh, staff made uh, really no reference to that uh, Cal OSHA is the risk management uh, entity that governs this type of operation. And they have recently implemented new regulations and there's no requirements that emphasize additional items be addressed for HF alkylation as part of that regulation. Uh, the district position uh, on presentation, I should say, rather on sulfuric acid versus HF, somewhat misleading in that just the straight chemical composition is not uh, relevant when you keep the, the uh, chemical in the pipe. So we do everything to manage to keep the, chem the, uh, the acid within the unit, and therefore you have no air emissions. It's not an emission issue, it's a risk management. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. 
Ms. Hi. Fleming. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Louise Fleming. I'm a resident in Torrance, and I've lived in the South Bay actually for a total of about 30 years. And um, I just want to say that um, it's quite obvious that we have uh, quite a large representation of the oil uh, industry here, as well as uh, you know the refineries. Uh, that are claiming, and, and I do believe that they are sincere in offering, you know, all the mitigation uh, measures and protections. However, the problem is this is a bunch of cow manure because the truth of the matter is that accidents happen. It happened three years ago. We, as with uh, uh, oil spills, where we were promised safety measures uh, are in place, and lo and behold, we have royal uh, spills that are very uh, dangerous to our environment and uh, affect our uh, communities. Uh, bottom line is that we need to ban the hydrofluoric acid, uh, which uh, it just takes one more accident that is not protected by the grace of God, uh, that the debris falls less uh, than six feet from the storage tank, which is what uh, happened. It was only six feet from a catastrophic event. And by the way, um, you know, many of the uh, uh, workers live in the community, their own families would be hurt or killed in the event of Thank you a for catastrophic your event. Thank, Thank you. you. Ted, a few minutes. Okay. I'm Richard Slauson, so he's next, right? Good morning, uh, Dr. Parker and, and committee. My name is Ted Jimenez. I'm with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters, and I represent a lot of labor that not only work in this community, live in this community, but work at the refinery. Uh, I wanted to mention that, you know, would, and reiterate that this product, this HF, has been here for decades. It is a product, like any other product, that is considered toxic, something we need to not only continue to utilize to produce what it is we're making here. Jobs, fuel, products. And we need to learn to not only continue working with it, but what we supply is we supply educated, certified, and trained individuals who will also continue that education to make sure that not only are the workers safe, but the community is safe because they're also, like was just told, part of that community. The yellow signs behind me, I am sure that all people here are intelligent, and I would hope that they have taken the time to look at both sides of this fence. <clears throat> that they were not fed a fear that they're building a cancer on by asking you to ban it. We are opposed that you do not ban it. We are opposed to this. And I want to let you know that uh, this is something that will continue to be used, and it is something that will continue to be uh, worked with in a, in a, with the idea that we are protecting not only our workers, but our community. Uh, we need to remember that uh, as, as people in the community, this possible fear is, what is, is what's driving the, the, the banning of this product. Thank, Thank you, you for, for your, your time. Testimony. Megan Hayati. Good morning. My name is Megan Hayati. I'm a mother, a resident, a homeowner in Torrance. Um, I'm very concerned about the dangers of MHF to our community. And it's become clear to me that these mitigation efforts do not go far enough to adequately protect our community. And for that reason, I respectfully request that you act today. I urge you to um, ban MHF. Thank you. With the following uh, four lineup, uh, Claire Dotson, Roger Light, uh, David Boyle, 
And Melissa Finbreeze. I'm Richard Slauson. I was called I, as you're well. next, Mr. Slauson. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Slauson. I'm a 50-year <coughs> resident of the city of Torrance. Uh, my wife and I moved to this area for a number of reasons, <coughs> environment, great city, the city of Torrance, and also uh, the work opportunities that were in the South Bay area. I came out of the uh, Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Union, worked in the refineries for years, decades. Each of these facilities in the area, the industrial facilities, live under the same safety regulations and environmental rules that are observed by the Torrance Refinery. I know from personal experience that the refinery management and employees here are overly conscientious in enforcing these federal and state rules. And no one comes into the refinery without having a good and thorough knowledge of refinery safety and operations. I know from having worked in these facilities as well, accidents happen. However, refinery personnel tirelessly continue to see that they don't happen, or if they do, the work they have done will minimize any damage. This plant, this also includes the plant line, line operators who are responsible for safety operations in the area. The discussions that I've heard this morning seem to believe that we want to substitute one dangerous chemical for another. Refineries are inher inherently dealing with dangerous chemicals constantly and as chemical plants in the area. But what they don't say is that the big difference is if, if the AQMD forced this change was that we, with uh, MF, MHF, we would have one or continue to have one or two trucks per month coming into the plant, in and out of the plant. And if you change the sulfuric acid, as your Norton engineering report stated, you would have as many as Thank 10 to 15 trucks per day. Thank you for I don't testimony. want to see that happen. I do not Thank want to see a change. Testimony. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Dodson. Hi. Hi, my name is Claire Dodson. Um, I recently bought a house this year in South Redondo. And my home is within the debris field of what could have been in 2015. I received no disclosure about this hazard when I purchased the house, and no one in my neighborhood knows about MHF. No one has any clue that in 2015 an explosion had occurred and could have released MHF that could have affected everyone's families. The explosion occurred at 9 a.m. when school had just begun at Barrel Elementary, which is only one block from my home. As a concerned citizen, I urge you to ban MHF. Additionally, I'm a physician assistant that works in a local emergency room. And I promise you that if a spill of MHF were to happen, there is not adequate training or supplies to treat a large catastrophic event of this nature at a local emergency room. There would be many, many deaths and many injuries, as well as long-term consequences for people affected by MHF. Please consider banning this product. Thank you very much. Uh, Roger Light. Thank you for coming here and hearing us out. My name is Dr. Roger Light. I'm a neuropsychologist in uh, actually Redondo Beach, but just as if there uh, no smoking uh, areas on a plane didn't work or no peeing areas in a pool, we're all uh, unfortunately at risk in the South Bay. Uh, I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, the hydrofluoric acid was, all of us who watch Breaking Bad understand it's not just any other chemical. Our favorite chemist, uh, Walt White, illustrated that when he uh, not only destroyed a body, but a tub and several floors of a house with that particular chemical. Uh, it is real important to keep in mind, I worked in a hospital for 23 years, and I appreciate the physician assistant's point there, that this kind of emergency is uh, catastrophic and nothing that we would be prepared for in any place in the world. And yes, 50 years of safety with this particular chemical is a nice history. I was um, about 50 miles away from Mount St. Helens when it blew up. 
And that was about a thousand years that nothing had happened there. It just takes one. When you think about terrorism, when you think about earthquakes, we, I, and I appreciate the jobs. I appreciate the jobs you do, absolutely. But keep in mind, if that blows up, the jobs that will be kept are coroners, physicians, and no one wants that. Thank you. Thank you very much. David uh, Bull. Good morning. My name is, uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is David Boulay. I'm a third generation Southern Californian, and I've lived in Torrance for the last 25 years. As you know, the refinery in Torrance has a well-documented years-long record of flare-ups, fires, power disruptions, explosions, failed alarm systems, injuries, and death. First with ExxonMobil and now with the Torrance Refinery Company, management of the refinery has demonstrated repeated neglect, lax oversight, and corporate indifference to safety and operating standards. Add the storage and use of modified hydrofluoric acid to this sorry history and we're facing a ticking time bomb. It's time for government to step in. I'm here to add my, today to add my voice to, who, to those who say enough. This extremely significant threat to the life and the economy of this region must be taken seriously and addressed now. Listen to those who have the most to lose. The facts are clear, the science is clear. The refinery continues to inform us that MHF fails, falls to the ground upon release and is 90% safer than HF. That's a lie. I have some more, I'm gonna shut it down. I see my time's running out. The first responsibility of government is the safety of its citizens. Please require the Torrance Refinery Company to stop the use of modified hydrofluoric acid and make the refinery safe for its workers and the residents of Torrance. Again, thank you for this hearing. Thank you very much. Melissa? Uh, before Melissa, would the following lineup, Steve Goldsmith, Tanner Bonds, Cliff Heiss, and uh, Kendall from LA Area Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, committee members and staff. My name is Melissa Fembrez, and I work for the Valero Wilmington Refinery, and I'm an active volunteer in the Wilmington community. And I'm deeply concerned about Rule 1410. This policy impacts far more than just our local community in the South Bay. It impacts families, commuters, businesses across the LA Basin. We know that working and other low-income families are already disproportionately paying for their energy needs. This policy could drive the costs even higher. That means we'd be paying a total of $16 in taxes, fees, mandates, and hidden taxes every time we fill up our tank. This hidden gas tax is simply too much for us to handle. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Steve Goldsmith. Uh, good morning. My name is Steve Goldsmith. I'm with the Torrance Refinery Action Alliance, and I acknowledge the great work the staff has done in this rulemaking. Um, I also want to acknowledge the tremendous efforts that the community has done. Um, we're an organization that does not want the refinery to close. We've specifically addressed that in our internally and in all of our communications. Uh, we've sincerely examined the scientific evidence and come to the conclusion that HF and MHF must go. We've done outreach to the community and someone asked if, uh, you know, we present only 3%. <laughs> This is uh, 10,000 signatures on petitions that we will make copies and submit electronically to you. Um, we went door to door, we've been going door to door, and I can tell you from personal experience and from the experience of all the canvassers that about eight or nine to one people are willing to sign the petition. We have a limited number of volunteers, but when we knock on those doors, that's the kind of response we get. Um, 500 people marched. A year ago, um, thousands of people have sent letters to your board and to the state legislature. We're nonpartisan, uh, but we do want um, this HF to go. Uh, we think that the claim that the refineries would close, uh, which they have never actually made in public, nor to their shareholders, which reflects what they honestly uh, have to report, and um, that. Uh, that they won't close. So all this stuff about gas and price increases is a red herring. Um, and um, I got started in this when I got ash on me that day. I would have been killed if the hydrofluoric acid had been released. 
and a former employee called me about a off-site release, April 2nd, 1999, in which four people outside the refinery were hospitalized, and um, uh, there are records testimony. of that. Oh, so quick. Okay. Thank you. And eight years Thank is you. much too long. Thank you. Tana Bonds. My name is Tanae Bonds, and I work at the Valero Wilmington Refinery. I stand for those who are concerned about the impacts of this ban. Our working families do not need this hidden gas tax. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I, I think that uh, I don't have to say it, but as we're reading the name, sometimes uh, if you, your handwriting is like mine, it's some kind of difficult. So if we pronounce your name incorrectly, it's only because uh, both uh, Mayor McCallum and myself are having difficult reading it. The next person is Cliff Heiss. Hi, I am Cliff Heiss. And I'd like to ask a rhetorical question. Just what is MHF? Is MHF hydrogen fluoride plus 50% modifier? That was originally presented back in the 1990s and was ruled uh, safer than sulfuric acid by our glorious uh, safety advisor? Or is it hydrogen fluoride plus 30% modifier, which was tried at the refinery and failed? Or is it hydrogen fluoride and 10% modifier, which I believe is what the refinery is using now? 10% modifier offers basically no protection uh, above straight hydrogen fluoride. 10% is literally nothing. So the next time somebody talks about what good is modified hydrogen fluoride, ask them, what modified hydrogen fluoride are you referring to? 50%, 30%, or maybe the minuscule 10% that the refineries are presently using. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kendall? Good morning. My name is Kendall Ascension, and I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles before, area Chamber of Commerce. If you might, before you start, uh, David Sweet and Dan Hoffman and Tom Ressler and Donna from the Torrance Area Chamber lineup. Thank you. As I stated, I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, and I wanted to thank you all for the opportunity of public comment today. We, uh, our organization represents over 1,600 businesses in the region. We oppose the ban and phase out of MHF. As the CEC has indicated, this would require two of our local refineries to shutter. And these refineries are tasked with the difficult ability of producing high quality gasoline for California. This would have negative impacts for our businesses and community members alike which include a 26 cent increase in gas tax, which would in turn increase cost of living and doing business throughout the region, as well as increasing the cost of our commute. We urge you to oppose a ban on MHF, but encourage you to, inc to make sure that it is used safely. Thank you. David uh, Sweet. David Sweet, I'm a resident of Torrance. I'm about a mile from the refinery. And uh, I will say that I have noticed the noise has decreased since the refinery uh, company has taken over. Sorry, not speaking. I think part of it is I've got to hold it up here. How's that? There you go. There you go. Okay, the next person's going to have to adjust it. Um, I'm saying that I have noticed the noise has gone down uh, in our neighborhood. We're close enough we could hear a lot of it from before. So I do want to say that changes have been made. I just personally feel like that's not the same kind of thing we're talking about. We're talking about a highly toxic and deadly chemical and a potential for release. Also, I'm looking at the cost in the presentation here. And while the quotes that were cited were the high end of the high end of the estimates, 900 million, if we take the middle of the estimates and we take the, es the high end of the middle of the estimates, though, and the estimates that were given for all the mitigations, it's about the same. So my recommendation is to ban <coughs> MHF and to use the money that you would use for mitigations toward getting rid of it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dan. I don't know how to fix this mic now. <laughs> Can't tear up the equipment. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Dan Hoffman. I'm the executive director for the Wilmington Chamber of Commerce, but I'm here on behalf of the South Bay Association of Chambers of Commerce also. Um, at this time, I'd like to take just a moment to ask those unions, the, the employees, the contractors, and the residents who support, or actually who are opposed to the ban of MHF, to please stand. We appreciate the working group, the work they have done. We appreciate the, the work the staff has done. But we are here this morning to protect our jobs, our local economies, and to ensure we continue safe and affordable fuels. We stand together this morning to oppose a ban on MHF. We all support com safe communities and economic vitality and jobs, and we thank you for your time. I'm confused. Uh, yeah. the, there were some people dead. standing that had banned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I might not have heard him correctly. <laughs> okay. Good morning. My name is Donna Duperon, and Excuse I, me, Donna. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get to the next four up. Tom uh, Reschler. Is Tom here? Okay, Tom is not here. Before you uh, begin <clears throat> with the following lineup, Mark Friedman, Dorothy Moore, Sandra Vieira, and Rita Weisman. Donna, you're on. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Donna Duperon, and I actually live within 400 meters of the refinery, and I have lived there for 23 years. I am also president and CEO of the Torrance Area Chamber of Commerce, which represents more than 751 local businesses, and I too was a member of the 1410 rulemaking group. First, as a long time, of res long time resident of this community, it's been frustrating to watch a small group of activists spread misinformation and use scare tactics to influence public opinion. The Torrance Refinery is a valuable part of our local community. I have been encouraged to see so many people in our community rise up to support our refinery and are here today. We as a community want an honest, fact-based discussion about the merits of this issue. The truth of the matter is that the refinery has never experienced an off-site release of HF or MHF since its use began in 1966. We in the community want a safe refinery and appreciate many of the laws and regulations that make California's refinery regulations the strictest in the rules. But make no mistake about it, we want our refinery here in business. So as the AQMD looks at this issue, base your decisions on facts, not emotion or biased information from activists. Our refinery deserves better. Our community deserves better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I, I want to, as Mark uh, comes to the microphone, to make a comment. You only get a chance to speak once. We're recognizing there are several cards from the same person that is in the stack, but you only get a chance to speak once at public comment. So we're going to not be calling your name twice if you have two cards. So I just want everybody to understand that. Mark, go right ahead. Thank you. I am here to learn. I am here as a 30-year trade unionist, but also as a health teacher, concerned about the environmental impact, but also concerned about jobs, increasing the number of jobs, and defending them. We cannot counterpose the jobs to the health concerns. If we do that, we are permanently split. We are all workers. We all deserve jobs. We all deserve a healthy environment. And for us to be pitted against each other as we are in this room is a dead end for us. This has historically been a problem of the environmental movement. 
I maintain that union safety committees and environmental groups have a common ground. If we say no job losses, can the companies pay? Damn straight they can. Can the refineries pay? You better believe it. Look at their billion dollar profits. So there should be no job losses, no shutdown without continued full pay of every worker in every refinery. There is no reason to counterpose these. We need a unifying strategy of environmental groups. We just had a victory with the ranchers in Oregon and Nevada, stopping the frame up of the U by the US government. But we lost one at the Dakota pipeline. Why? Demonstrations were called off. And let's file a lawsuit. <coughs> well, we know where that ended up. So in conclusion, I stand in both camps, but say we need not be divided, because if we continue to be divided, Neither of us will win, and the boss man will win. The boss man will win. They don't care about the health and safety of sisters and brothers in the plant, nor in the community. I've been on health and safety committees, and we battle management every day. The environmental community battles management every day, because the companies don't give a damn about the health and safety, whether you're workers in the community Thank you. or workers in the Thank plant. You. You know, I would uh, like to ask all of our speakers, I think uh, we call this meeting for you to address us and to let us know so if you can kind of uh, be addressing the committee. Uh, we don't want to have personal confrontation itself of the speakers with that of the audience. So the next person is Dorothy Moore. Yes, uh, Dorothy Moore. Uh, I'm a Torrance homeowner and business owner, both one mile and a half away from the refinery. I really didn't want to be here today, but I felt obliged as a family physician to protect our community's health and safety. I shouldn't have to. I'm angry that we are still discussing and not acting on a ban of MHF. When PBF Energy purchased at a small fraction of the value, I thought, yay, they understand about the MHF problem and they're gonna change it out, but they're not. MHF has not been proven safe. Accidents happen. We're human. In a nine month period, PBF had 97 incidents, probably largely left over from ExxonMobil, uh, but it included a, cr a crane collapse and two fires. Uh, in 2015, it was due to aging equipment. You think the aging equipment has gotten better with time? Are you going to ignore the Chemical Safety Board and the EPA inspection that showed that we cannot rely on their safety measures. The latest sensors and sirens and mitigation are nice, but they are not gonna protect us. We can use that money toward a real solution. We are overdue for a major earthquake. It's been 24 years since we've had anything bigger than a 5.5. You cannot shelter in place when your windows are broken. Human error, aging equipment, in an earthquake zone, not to mention the possibility of terrorism, I have a pool. I don't carry chlorine gas because I know the risk. I switch to a salt solution. Okay? Not a single life should ever be lost to something that's foreseeable and entirely preventable. And it won't be just one life like in 2015. It could be thousands. And children are the most vulnerable. We can create jobs to convert to ionic liquid Look at Chevron, two and Thank a half years. Thank you for years. your testimony. Okay. Just you. force their hand Thank and ban you. MHF. Sandra. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sandra Vieira, and I'm a teacher in Torrance Unified. My most basic charge as a teacher is to keep students safe. And after Sandy Hook, the reality of that charge hit home at the elementary schools, so we created more contingency plans. Edison Elementary is a few blocks from the refinery, and my room is right next to the playground. So it was determined that if we had to shelter in place and the students were at recess or lunch, all 200 five to seven year olds would be ushered into my classroom. So the thought of getting all those children into my classroom before a cloud of MHF strikes is daunting. But that is only the first step, because then I have to prevent the gas from entering the classroom. So the plan calls for duct tape all around the doors, the windows, and the vents. Now classrooms don't have ladders and my ceiling is tall. I do have tables, so my plan is I'd get a table, I'd put a chair on top of that, 
I would actually first have to move the kids to get to the bin that has the duct tape, then move the table, put the chair on top, tape off one vent. I would have to repeat that process three times for three vents. Then I have to tape the windows. Same thing, they're tall, I need to move tables. Um, then I would have to do the door. My, like I said before, Edison is about four blocks away with the average wind speed uh, in Torrance. I calculated it's about four to seven minutes before the cloud would reach me. Now in the news, we've seen teachers act heroically in the, fa in the face of gun violence over and over again. But a teacher can't save a life by tackling an MHF cloud. And all these plans for duct tape will not keep our children safe. Now, after Sandy Hook, the teachers had a police training, and the Torrance police told us that we had to be willing to think fast and put our lives on the line for our children and to keep the children's safety above all. Thank you. And that is Thank why I'm here today. Go ahead. Uh, next, uh, after the next speaker, would Jane Afonso, Ron Miller, Lori Zarinsky, and Ty Carlson line up. Is Rita Weissman? Who's, are you Rita? No. Is Rita Weitzman? Rita is not here. Okay. I'm Ron Miller. Jane? You Jane? Hi, I'm Jane Afonso from Redondo Beach, and I want to thank Dr. Fine and your staff for the exhausting work and also the excellent presentation. So we are finally dispelling the myth, the refinery myth, that MHF is safe. Now we have the myth that there will be a loss of jobs. I just want to say that you can ban MHF and not have a loss of jobs, as others have said. The refineries can stand um, a temporary and planned shutdown but they can't withstand an immediate um, shutdown due to a release of the MHF. In South Korea in 1982, there was a release of, um, let's see, 16,000 pounds, and 18 people were severely injured, five were dead, 12,000 were treated for exposure, thousands were evacuated, millions were suffered in business losses. This could extend all the way to LAX, so you can imagine the losses the community would not allow a refinery to continue under these circumstances. So all the jobs would be lost, in addition to many other job losses, loss of property value, loss of property taxes and sales taxes. Um, our community would be devastated. So if you're worried about economic losses, the new red herring, you should ban MHF. But that's not your job. Your job is to make the community safe. And I urge you to ban MHF. These mitigation measures are not enough and the refineries will stay open. That's their business model. Thank you. Can I ask staff if they are aware of that Korean, and what she's saying is true? Yes, what she's saying is true, and staff is aware of it. We have a uh, chronological timeline, if you will, that we can provide. This was actually uh, provided at the last committee meeting, but we can also provide this to the members of the committee today. Was that a refinery? It seemed like it was a, a tanker spill at a chemical plant. Okay. <coughs> Ron Miller. Good morning. I'm Ron Miller, Executive Secretary of the LA Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council. I represent over 100,000 hardworking men and women and if I can get them to stand up here today, I brought some friends with me. These folks live in and around the community. I couldn't get everybody to come because we got a Martin Luther King breakfast happening. We got a women's march. And so these are the folks that live in and around the community and that work at the refineries in the area. So let me answer a rhetorical question that was put out there earlier about MHF and what it is. MHF is something that's used at two refineries here, but over half the refineries in the United States of America, and it's used safely. And it's used in lots of industries in the Southland, besides refineries. And I'm going to sound like a Chamber of Commerce guy here, but 
We are in lockstep with the Chamber of Commerce and many folks in the community that we got to keep these refineries open. There is no pause in jobs here for, for shutdowns. Ask General Motors, ask Ford, ask McDonnell Douglas, ask Boeing, ask all the big industries that have left this area and decimated the local communities. Look at your downtown areas. The economies are decimated. So we oppose this ban. We want to keep the refineries open. We bring the skilled trained workforce to the refineries and we're very proud of it. And we're going to continue to operate these refineries safely. Thank you. Uh, uh, uh. Lori? Is it? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Lori Zaremski, and I am here to urge you to address the health and safety concerns and ban MHF. I appreciate your service, and I believe that your duty is to protect the quality of the air. I, uh, while I respect people's need to have jobs, I think that that is just a ridiculous distraction and a red herring. Clearly, the refineries and corporations would stay open. They would simply shift to work in a safer manner. Uh, all of the workers here, I think it's really unfortunate and sad that you are being deceived by your bosses that you would lose jobs. That is just ludicrous. I believe that the ban would accelerate the development of safer alternatives, and mitigation is not a safe option. And also, as far as these unlikely events, who on earth can talk about an unlikely event? We have 9-11, we have the fires, we have the floods, we have the mudslides. It's not an unlikely event, it is a guaranteed event. And when we have death, we are not going to have jobs. I think it's ludicrous for the Chambers of Commerce to be here promoting death of the community. Please ban MHF. Thank you so much. Ty. Before Ty speaks with the following lineup, David Hannum, Les Tate, Terry Scott, and Mark Heron. Ty Carlson, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Ty Carlson. I'm very concerned that the proposed rule will increase gasoline prices for tens of millions of Californians. You know, studies show at least 26 cents per gallon. This truly is a hidden tax of $5.6 billion on almost all of California. And this is on top of the recent California legislature that already added a very significant gas tax. Again, this will impact all, almost all Californians, businesses and families. Thank you. David uh, Hannum. Good morning. My name is Dr. David Hannum. I have no financial interest for or against hydrogen fluoride, but I have a PhD in physics. My specialty is in plasma and fluid physics. I once gave a guest lecture at Princeton, and they're at their uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Labs on plasma fluid instability, and in the private sector, I've worked on developing hypersonic gas valves for Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, currently work uh, with X-ray detection. Today, I speak as a member of TRAA's eight-member science panel. Seven of us have PhDs. Um, mainly on the topics that Dr. Fine raised during his presentation, uh, he made it clear the terrifying threat of modified hydrofluoric acid and what is contained in one holding tank, just a single holding tank, if 11% of that is released in an accident to the community. But that was a single holding tank. All told, there could be up to 125 tons of it stored at the Torrance refinery alone, not counting Valero. If a natural or man-made disaster ruptures the holding tanks, hundreds of thousands of lives are at risk. Ignoring this accident waiting to happen is like ignoring terrorists planning an attack with 100 times more casualties than 9-11. So it's dangerous, but refineries are inherently dangerous. There's an inherent risk to operating them. Uh, it's, MHF is a toxic airborne threat, and it's the AQMD's job to make us safe from that. 
the tiered implementation presented here today of Rule 1410 won't protect us. The AQMD can't claim ignorance on this issue. MHF will flash atomize into tiny drops as it leaks. One point that Dr. Fine got wrong was that the ground temperature has to be 67 degrees for uh, MHF to boil, to vaporize. At the temperatures and pressures at which it stores, it will vaporize as it escapes a tank even on a cold winter day. The, there's one way to make the community safe, to protect the community, and that's to ban MHF. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act means that PBF and Valero get 100% tax deduction on the first year capital investments, like converting to a safer alkylation technology. That's on top of a hefty corporate tax cut. There's never been a more affordable time to create new jobs, invest in the future, and convert to a safer technology. So the same old people saying the same old things, for me, that's saying ban MHF. Less tape. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide this uh, uh, statement in the uh, public comment. My name is Les Tate. I work at the Blair Wellington Refinery. Uh, here in California, we know that our gasoline is refined under strict standards for refinery safety in the United States. <clears throat> we just instituted uh, new refinery safety regulations and have been celebrated as one of the strictest in the nation, if not the world. <clears throat> Uh, they were developed in collaboration with state and federal safety experts, labor unions, community organizations to protect safety of all the workers in surrounding communities. These safety regulations are in place are work for our workers and our communities. <clears throat> we must ensure that we can provide California with an affordable fuel supply for the, commit for the commuting of daily needs. <clears throat> On a personal note, um, as, we, as we speak about the safety, and working with the HF asset. Um, I currently work there, my son currently works there. My job as a parent is to provide safety. I don't think I would put my son at risk, allowing him to work there. Um, the ban, I, or I, I oppose the ban. Um, I believe we need to work with the AQMD and all the agencies just like we have to cut smog. I grew up in the LA Basin. I remember smogglers. We don't do those anymore, thanks to the good work of the people working together. So, thank you. Thank you. Terry Scott. Uh, yes, hello. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing so that you can get input from all of our um, various perspectives. Uh, my family has resided in the South Bay since 1926. Um, I raised my four children here. I'm a mom, I'm a grandmother. My 87-year-old mom lives in Torrance. And for about 15 years of my life, I worked as an assistant to Dr. Ian Mitroff, who was a business professor in the school at USC. And he was one of the founders of the field of crisis management. And the work that he was doing involved research into major industrial accidents, whether it was the Bhopal poisoning uh, at the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India, in which 2,500 people died outright, over 200,000 were permanently injured, or if it was a Challenger's disaster, uh, the Exxon Valdez spills, these kind of major industrial accidents is what we were looking into. And the thing that was so clear is that there were always early warning signals which were ignored. And had those been heeded, perhaps something would have been done that could have prevented that industrial disaster from happening. What I'm hearing today, just as a member of the public, is that even with all of the mitigation options, there is no real safe way to prevent a possible disaster. I'm here as a, just as a resident asking you to please look forward, use forward thinking, to me it feels like we're trying to patch together ways to make an aging plant safe for the community, when what we really should be doing is looking towards the future. And I don't see that, that continuing to use the MHF is a good idea. Please ban it. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next four who would uh, speak in this order, Leah Flynn, Robert Kaplan, Vanessa Rodriguez, 
and Rebecca Ros Rosenthal. Mark Hara. Is Mark he still here? Mark is not here. Okay. Leah Flynn. Thank you guys for having this meeting today and letting us all speak, and also for doing it on a weekend during the day when we can come. Um, so I'm a homeowner in West Torrance, and I'm also a wife of a firefighter. As a wife of a firefighter, I understand preparedness, and we've, we've, uh, we've talked about ways to keep our family safe in the case of a major earthquake or fire or unfortunately terrorist attack, and also unfortunately in the case of an HF cloud coming towards our house. With all the tragic loss of life that's happened this year, the fires up north, fires in Santa Barbara, the mudslides, um, the hurricanes in, in Houston and all that, and also some of the terrorist attacks that's happened in Las Vegas, it seems really reasonable to take steps, any steps that we can take to prevent loss of life, tragic loss of life in our community um, from something that we can control, something like MHF. So um, I really urge you to take the steps necessary to prevent this, unavo this avoidable loss of life. Um, I don't mind sending my husband up to, to respond to natural disasters, but it would really break my heart if he was exposed in responding to a, an MHF explosion. And there's been a lot of talk about preparedness and, and risk aversion at the, um, or risk, mit risk mitigation at the power plant or at the refinery, but there hasn't been a lot of talk about the transportation of the HF to and from and the offloading at the refinery, and that's also a risk that's a big concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robert uh, Kaplan. Morning, my name is uh, Robert Kaplan, and I live in Redondo Beach. Um, first of all, and I wasn't expecting to say this, but sitting in this room and just listening, um, to other people and seeing everybody listening to each other uh, is just such a great feeling for me. It, uh, it really does truly make me feel American and different from what we might expect in other countries. And uh, I think that process is uh, in, invaluable. And uh, I uh, only wish I could sit down for coffee with all of the people here I don't know, um, how much more I would know after that. So I'm glad everybody else came too. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Commerce's ha Chambers of Commerce have uh, mentioned uh, the cost of gasoline and some other people have too and I think that's uh, useful. That can drive up the cost of health care and so forth. I wanted to suggest a modification of it for folks on your uh, committee who are economists, and that is to look at the um, cost of <coughs> gas uh, relative to the cost of living and other things. And what I'm thinking about here is a trajectory over time uh, in the cost, in the relative cost <coughs> of gas as we move uh, to driverless trucks. There are estimates that we're going to see hybrid. Uh, trucks on the road, that's going to have an impact on the gas market. Uh, electrification of cars, um, uh, solar energy yesterday, I think, or the day before in the LA Times, um, the Energy Board for California announced that there is an excess of solar energy. And uh, of course, somebody like uh, Thomas Anderson is going to make the break. Thank you. Storage. Thank so you for your testimony. Rodriguez. <coughs> Hello and good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to express my stance on this matter. My name is Vanessa Rodriguez and I am employed by the Torrance Refining Company as a health, safety, and environmental administrative assistant. The refinery to me is a home away from home. Right. Not only is this place a place that makes me feel like I make a difference in the world, but it also holds some of the best people that I have the pleasure of supporting. I have had the opportunity to work at the Torrance Refinery as a contractor and now as an employee. 
Being able to work day in and day out with both groups has, made, has opened my eyes to see that the refinery has an exquisite safety culture like no other. The refinery prides itself in operating safely, reliably, and efficiently. Working safely and keeping its employees, contractors, and the community is an expectation that is, all, is throughout our entire business. Knowing and applying our safety procedures and safe work practices and much, <coughs> and much more helps us to achieve this goal of ultimately becoming the flagship refinery of the PBF Energy subsidiaries. I ask you to please, as you make your decision, please base your decision on facts. On the Torrance Refinery website, you can find tons of things and you will also be receiving a folder with a lot of information that I personally help put together for all of you guys. So I please ask you to please do your research before you make that decision. Thank you for your time. Before the next speaker with the following lineup, David Campbell, Eric Nak Nakano, Penny Versing, and Peter Burgess. Rebecca Rosenthal. Is Rebecca here? Rebecca Rosenthal. Not here. Okay, the next speaker then will be David Campbell. If you would uh, please, when we call your name, please, please come up. It would save, you know, time. David Campbell. David. David is not here. Person is Eric uh, Nakano. Nakano. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Eric Nakano. I'm a resident in Torrance. I wanted to come to urge uh, the district to please ban MHF and please do it sooner than eight years. Um, I wanted to address the, the, the question of posing jobs and, and health and safety in, in the community. Um, Every time a big company is pressed with an environmental concern or a health and safety concern, or for that matter, higher wages and, and better benefits, the response is always, well, that's going to cost jobs, right? Um, and I look back on what a, what a previous speaker was talking about, the car analogy, which I like as well. Uh, when the law was introduced to require seat belts in all cars, the auto industry opposed that law on the basis that, A, it was unnecessary because cars are already safe. B, it would be too costly to retrofit manufacturing systems. And C, it's going to cost jobs. Well, that law passed. Uh, the industry is fine. And uh, cars are safer. So I'm posing to you that in this situation, similarly, the companies that run these refineries are not simply going to walk away and shut off the lights from these multi-billion dollar facilities. <coughs> It's a calculation. They're going to have to weigh out uh, the, the cost of investing in new technology to use an alternative to MHF versus the price that they can get for selling the facility. Either way, whether it's the existing owners of the facility operating um, or a new owner who bought the facility from PBF or Valero, um, the, the way that they're going to bring in profits is to maximize the operation at the, at the plant. And that is what's going to be able to retain all those jobs that we're all concerned about. And so the bottom line is, let's not look at it like it's, it's health and safety versus jobs, but rather, as I think someone else mentioned, we can actually have both. We can have a safer community, those jobs can remain in place, and, and hopefully new jobs can be created by the technologies that will be generated by the conversion to a safer alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Penny? Hi, my name is Penny Wersing, and I'm a, a resident of the South Bay and an environmental manager at the Torrance Refinery. As such, I understand that we need to earn the right to operate in the community. I know, as all of the employees here today know, that the safety of the community and the environment is of the utmost importance, and we're committed to operating the refinery safely, reliably, and environmentally, environmentally responsibly. While we respect the community's concern about the use of MHF at the Torrance Refinery, we are confident that the many layers of protection, mitigation steps, 
and safety systems the refinery has in place allows the MHF alkylation unit to operate safely. A ban on MHF could je jeopardize the viability of the Torrance refinery, which has operated in the city of Torrance for nearly 90 years <coughs> and is one of the largest taxpayers. It would put over 1,100 good paying jobs um, of it, refinery employees and contractors at risk, as well as thousands of jobs provided through small businesses and companies that provide support services to the refinery. And requiring that the refinery ultimately install untested technology, <coughs> excuse me, under tier three that would cost several times more than the value of the refinery itself is infeasible. As others here have stated today, I urge you to consider the facts when making your decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before the next speaker with the following lineup, Sally Ayati, Steve Griffin, Julie Bofinger, and Tim Shepard. Pete Burgess? Yes. yes, my name is Peter Burgess. I'm a local South Bay resident. Um, I thank the opportunity to the board to give me the opportunity to address you and want to thank the, the staff for putting together all the information that has been provided that was summarized by Dr. Fine. I want to focus my comments on the information that they have provided to you. Um, if I can refer to slide six, um, of the presentation and assessment of MHF technology. I wanted to point out a few things in terms of what it means. The staff have told you that in regards to the modification um, and the impact that it has, some but uncertain HF mitigation benefits are offered. That's uh, what that means is that you want to know whether or not the modification does anything significant. Maybe it does some. It's uncertain. That's very important. Um, secondly, um, what, what ability does the modification, the sulfalane that's put in there, as it's used, um, does it have to prevent formation of vapor aerosol cloud? It's uncertain. Someone wants to ask, some, someone comes to you and says, okay, MHF, we're using that. Do we know that that doesn't create a, uh, a cloud um, that's uh, ground-based that can spread for miles? No. That's really, really important. Um, so, you know, the evidence does not show that the additive um, can prevent this kind of disaster that could happen, could spread for miles. I want to mention that if it's 5,200 pounds that could be released in the uh, best case scenario, and maybe it's double or triple from that, I just want to reference, the uh, goldfish tests from 1986 showed that an 8,300 uh, pound release, which is well within what's possible, that spread for a distance of five miles at lethal levels and was immediately dangerous to life and health for seven Thank and a half miles. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Sally Hayata. Hello, I'm Sally Hayati. I'm the president of the Torrance Refinery Action Alliance, and I'd like you to envision in your mind's eye the more than 10,000 people that have signed our petition standing in support behind me. Um, in 1990, government responded to demands for a ban on HF because of a near miss in 87 by requiring multiple layers or tiers of mitigation, including modified HF, ver certified as a fail-safe mitigation measure for HF. But it's not. The evidence is rock solid. We can present it to any of you. In fact, I'd love the opportunity to do so. That MHF is just as deadly as HF. Um, TRA investigation, Chemical Safety Board, and the EPA have verified this. The human, uh, if the MHF tank had ruptured in 2013, 23 schools and thousands of homes could have been immersed for two to three hours in a lingering HF fog toxic enough to kill because it was a calm day, worst case scenario. The consequences of a significant MHF release uh, would be a regional catastrophe, thousands of deaths and injuries an immediate shutdown of both MHF alkylation units would be demanded. That would have far greater impact than the planned and timely replacement of MHF that Rule 1410 should mandate. There are no fail-safe MHF mitigation measures. Timely replacement is the only solution 
for our region, which has higher population density than any other HF refinery community in the nation outside Philadelphia, high risk of powerful earthquakes on multiple faults, and designation as a high threat urban area for terrorists. MHF could be re replaced within four years. Let's make jobs by requiring the replacement. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony. Steve Grit. Thank you. My name is Steve Giffen. I'm a resident of a neighboring community. I volunteer in the city of Torrance. I am a registered engineer and I am also a PhD. Uh, for the last 15 years, I have worked at the Torrance Refinery in a variety of positions in engineering and management. I've had the opportunity to become very familiar with the alkylation technology, the people involved in its operation and maintenance, and the redundant systems that protect the community and the environment. I can personally attest for the care with which the workers at the Torrance Refinery approach their responsibility to keep them safe, themselves safe, their co-workers safe, and maintain the safety of the community. I'm also personally familiar with the multiple ad additional active and passive mitigation systems mm -hmm. that are employed as we operate every day. I appreciate that the board appropriately recognizes there are a variety of strong opinions on both sides of the subject. I want you to know that myself, like many others, support decision-making by the board that is based on rational engineering and sound science. Thank you. Thank you very much. Julie? Good morning. I'm Julie Boffinger. I'm a resident of the South Bay for the last 26 years, 25 of which in Torrance, and I'm a refinery employee at the Torrance Refinery. As such, it's the utmost importance to me, the safety of my family, my fellow community members, and my coworkers. So it's hard to hear statements that are not based on fact, that are not based on sound science, and more importantly, do not represent who we are and what we do at the Torrance Refinery. With my chemical engineering background, I've had many positions. Energy engineer, where I helped make us energy efficient as a site. I've worked as the Alki engineer, both as the process engineer and control engineer, for over a decade and helped implement MHF. I've been a project engineer and project manager on reclaim emissions monitoring, rule 1118, flare monitoring, Alki clean fuels. I've seen the rigor in the engineering and the science that goes into these projects and systems. Now. As a business team manager in operations at the refinery, I see and I participate firsthand in what we do there, how safety is the priority, how it is embedded in everything that we do. I have 97 team members that I'm directly responsible for to get them home safely to their family and friends. I have a responsibility to my fellow community members, which I take seriously, to keep them safe in their homes as I am safe in my home in their community, in our community. Okay. So, I would not live where I do, I would not work at the Torrance Refinery if I did not know the science and rigorous engineering that has gone into this, and that safety is at the center of everything that we do at that facility. So I urge the board to base your decisions on science, on fact, to allow the continued use of MHF, to work with the refineries on the Tier 1 and Tier 2 measures, Thank you very much and for your testimony. And reconsider Tier 3. Thank you. For the next uh, speaker with the following lineup, Jeremy Harris, Judy Herman, <coughs> Paul Denard, and Connie Sullivan. Tim? Good morning. I'm Tim Shepard. I'm the Vice President of Technical Services for HF Alkylation Consultants. And I've had the privilege of working along with the refineries as well as the AQMDs uh, team over the last year and a half, and it's been a tremendous experience. I want to thank you first and foremost for that. Um, regarding HF and hydrous and modified HF, I've worked uh, nearly 30 years with these unique chemicals, and I, I probably can say I'm uh, one of just a few people that's actually ever seen a release in a laboratory or in the field of actual HF or modified HF. and so. Uh, to hear the fears and the concerns 
it's, it's enlightening to me to hear the, the <coughs> rhetoric and that's gone on, but nonetheless, I appreciate that this board has a, a weighty responsibility. Regarding some of the discussions around 751's language and building an enclosure, certainly LPG poses a significant hazard, both to the workforce and even the community at large. And for these reasons and others in closing the process, uh, was part of what's been considered and did not become part of the toolkit, if you will, that uh, is the language of 751. So that initial committee's discussions of whether it should or should not be employed, at least to my knowledge, has not been done on any reactor system of any alkylation unit anywhere in the world. And I've visited uh, personally inside of over 50 HF units, uh, alkylation units, motor fuels. And Dr. Burke, with re reference to your question about the Gumi Korea incident, I believe that was close to 2012 at a chemical facility, and our company has done some research on that exact incident and, and the findings. And lastly, regarding the uh, EPA's information on worst case scenarios, they warn that characterizing data using only worst case scenarios can be misleading and unnecessarily alarming. <coughs> Jeremy Harris. Good morning, Jeremy Harris, Senior Vice President with the Long Beach Area Chamber of Commerce. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. We're, the Chamber's here on behalf of our leadership, our members of over 800 folks that make up our Chamber to support the use of MHF and oppose any type of ban or phase out. I'm here on behalf of our small businesses that make up our community, those folks that live and spend their discretionary income that actually work in the refineries, including those folks that are, are building trades, brothers and sisters. See, these are good high paying jobs, good wages that these folks spend in our community and our small businesses rely on. And if those were to go away, those small businesses doors would close. As has been stated before, and certainly will be stated time and time again, banning or phasing out MHF is a non-starter and is economically viable, not viable for our refinery partners. In the interest of time, I'll close with, on behalf of the Chamber, our members and our partners, respectfully ask that you oppose any type of ban or phase out. Thank you for the time. Judy Herman. Hello, I'm Judy Herman. Uh, I live in Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to address you, and I'm glad you're taking such careful uh, thought about these matters. Um, and even though I don't live in Torrance, I am within the, the splash zone if uh, a toxic cloud should be released. Uh, so I am concerned, and uh, I don't believe these are scare tactics. There's, there's hard science behind the, the difference in the uh, volatility of the different chemicals we're talking about. Um, who it is using the scare tactics is the, the refinery owners. They're scaring the workers into believing jobs would be lost, but uh, it's not true. They, they can switch to other uh, chemicals and uh, the, the technology is available, it will be improved, and it will be improved more rapidly if M MHF is banned, but uh, right now Chevron is uh, voluntarily converting its only HF alkylation unit to ionic liquids, and why would they do that? That's an expense to them. They must know that there's a, there's a danger in uh, MHF, and uh, it's necessary to convert and eight other California refineries uh, use sulfuric acid to process crude and uh, produce alkylate. So it, it can be done. Other refineries are doing it. Uh, the Wilmington and Torrance plants are the, the only ones in California that, that think they need to use uh, MHF, but uh, it's not necessary, and let's stop it. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Uh, good morning, board members. Um, my name is Paul Denard. I do not live in Torrance or the South Bay. I live in Cyprus on the other side of the San Gabriel uh, River in Orange County. I found out about this issue uh, from friends who are residents in the city 
And I thought, well, this really doesn't concern me. Until I found out that the outer edge of the second uh, circle of the kill zone uh, abutted up against the San Gabriel River Freeway. Um, I'm not a chemist, and so I don't really understand what's being said, pro or nay, on, the, on, on, the, on this chemical. However, there are ways that we can ensure that we will not be victims of an accident that could happen. We understand there are no fail-safe ways to prevent this action. In California, when I wanted to drive, I, I had a good uh, safety record, and yet I was compelled by insurance for those accidents that I could not guarantee 100% would not happen. I believe that what I have not heard in this discussion is post-disaster preparedness. I have not heard how much that would cost if it does happen. So if we're going to use this hazardous chemical, maybe we need to set up an insurance plan. And if there were no insurance companies that were willing to sell insurance for post-disaster uh, downstream effects of this, then that would tell us we can't afford this. That's, I think, a possible way to look at whether we should continue with this or not. Thank you. Before the next speaker, would the following line up? Uh, Mitch Ponce, Ulrich Blatler, Quan Lee, and Isabel Balboa. Connie? Sullivan. Hi. Hi, I'm Connie Sullivan. I want to thank you for taking your Saturday morning and coming out here and doing a deep dive into this really important issue. I, I very much appreciate that. I do have some comments that are sort of um, disjointed. I hope I make sense. Um, first of all, um, I am disappointed to see that um, staff is not proposing an outright ban, but is uh, providing an option of mitigation or a ban. Um, one good thing I see about that, I'm a union member. I'm a member of SEIU 721. So either way, there would be good union jobs that would come out of this for uh, my brothers and sisters in the unions. Uh, Dr. Parker mentioned uh, the 2015 explosion, but there was also a 1987 explosion at this same refinery. So. Uh, they do this at a pretty fast clip, not to mention the 1977 release of some chemical that snuffed out the life of a motorist driving by the refinery. I don't know what that chemical was. Um, in 2015, uh, the explosion, uh, we, the Chemical Safety Board says we had a near miss, and we were just lucky that uh, there wasn't a release that day. And luck is not a risk management plan as far as I'm concerned. We don't need to conjure up um, uh, terrorist attacks or earthquakes. We can just look at human error, which happens to all of us every day in our lives, and which led to the explosion in 2015. Um, and uh, that explosion, the electrostatic precipitator was destroyed. That was a piece of equipment that cost them $300 million. It was um, air pollution equipment that was required by the AQMD. Uh, so they spent $300 million on that, they exploded it, and they spent another $161 million fixing that. So these are the kinds of numbers that refineries deal with. I do not buy into the notion that they would be, have to Thank go out of business. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mitch. Good morning, uh, Dr. Parker and uh, staff of the AQ, A, uh, AQMD Refinery Committee. My name is Mitchell Ponce. I represent 5,000 members of the Iron Workers Union. Many of our members live in the Torrance area and throughout the South Bay. We oppose any ban on the, on the, the uh, HM, uh, on the uh, uh, MFH, MFH. <laughs> sorry. But uh, um, yeah, it, this would cause uh, hundreds of our members that do a lot of work in, throughout the refineries without the South Bay. So again, our members, oppose any ban or any modification. Thank you for your time. Rorich. Good morning, thank you for letting me speak here. Um, we always hear from the refinery that they are safe, but I think history shows that this is not true. 
Um, they had explosions, they had fires, they had everything. I read all the mitigation, um, tier one and tier two mitigation. In case of uh, a major event like an earthquake, if you would have power outages, and we know very well how powder, power outage affects the refinery, they have flares, they have uh, other problems, huge problems. If uh, power goes out, none of these mitigation uh, measures would work. So you have no uh, control over a release. You have 3,000 kids in less than a mile away. You have about six to seven minutes for the cloud to get there. In case of an earthquake, there would be no shelter in place. And even if there is no earthquake and there is a shelter in place, you heard it, you cannot tape all these windows shut, all these doors shut, all these vents shut. So to, for you right now, the thing is, you have to think, what should we do? And I think the only clear thing is to, to phase out this chemical. You don't want to sit there in a few years if something happens and ask yourself, why did we not do it when we had the chance? You have the chance now. Please do the right thing and phase out hydrofluoric acid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Juan, Juan, Juan Lee. Juan Lee is not here. Isabel Balboa. Isabel is not here. Okay, we're going to take four more and then we're going to break for lunch. Give everybody a break. Uh, usually, we have these meetings, we usually have a break in the morning, but we haven't had that. So we've gone all the way. I'm quite sure many of you. Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to suggest that maybe uh, we could read off 20 names of people who are going to testify and have them bring our sandwiches to the dais. And then you know, we can keep going through the lunch and if they don't mind watching us eat a sandwich. <laughs> and then the balance of them, oh, 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 oh. you guys. Not even for him, it. you can't yeah. do it for him. Yeah, either. right. You guys, have, I'm, I'm telling you, it's been spectacular. Testimony's been great today. Your, your participation has been great today. So let, let's keep it going into the afternoon. But if we could do that, then the rest of the people could go grab a little bite and come back and we wouldn't slow them down for however long it takes us to go to some room and eat a sandwich. Just a suggestion, but. Okay, I think that is a very good suggestion. I will, you know, poll my board members to see if we need a five or 10 minute break. Uh, and then we have the. Uh, oh, the kidney <coughs> break, I forgot kidney about break. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I think what we'll do, we'll take uh, 10 minutes and then we can have the lunch back here. Is, any, is there any objection to uh, proceeding as Dr. Burke has uh, suggested from the audience? <laughs> yes, we will read the 20 names before we take our bio break. Bio break. <laughs> uh, so why don't, we, why don't we proceed to do that? Uh, Isabel, is Isabel here? She's not here. So let's read the uh, 20 names. Uh. Okay, uh, David uh, Hugendorn, uh, Kenny Arnold, Tim Jeffries, Diane Wood, Jim Cooksey, Cooksey Kathy Luciano, Randy Thomas, Carla Devine, Eric Estrada, Gergheim, <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't read the rest of that. Uh, Armando Flores, Ramey McCoy, Hung Dong, Don Clay, Soon Gui, Penny Good, Joaquin Santos, Dennis A.K., DeAndrea Valencia. 
Is that 20? I have been counting. That must be 20. That must be 20. I'm going to put this. Yeah, those names that uh, uh, is any is, well, we'll just have to see. Those are the 20 names we'll if convene. If everybody's not here, would they please speak up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that works. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're reading my mind. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, 10 minutes back in this room, those and we will people. start back with those 20 people. The rest of you can take a 30 to uh, 40 minute break because each person will get uh, two minutes. Thank you very much.